Okay. All right, should be good. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Grant Cameron, and I have a very special uh, interview tonight. Uh, in 2012, I uh, attended a meeting called The Gathering in Philadelphia, uh, run by a guy by the name of Larry, and a number of the top researchers in the United States there. And it was there that I met uh, Chris Bledsoe and his wife, Yvonne. Uh, I didn't really spend that much time talking to them. I spent a lot of time talking to Yvonne and um, Chris was telling his story. It was in 2013 that um, I was going to Florida. I was going out of um, uh, Washington from the citizens hearing, rented a car. I stopped by uh, Chris's place and um, I spent a couple of days there had some very bizarre events happen that convinced me that Chris Bledsoe is the real deal. Tonight I have his son Ryan who has now done a few interviews. I've listened to all of them and he is a wonderful spokesman for uh, the Bledsoe family and for all the very bizarre things that have happened since 2007 on Elvis's birthday when uh, Chris had his awakening experience on the Cape Fear River. So good evening, Ryan. Hey, good evening, Grant. Um, I know it's been a little while since we've seen each other in person, but I, I do tend to keep up with you on Facebook. So beautiful. Now you and know. My, and my other guest is um, um, Bob McGuire, who is um, a who's who of intelligence. He's been in the intelligence field for a number of years. Uh, he was a, a, um, a professor at uh, Virginia Tech. Has two businesses, a PhD. But the thing that interests me most about Bob, and Bob is joining us to ask questions here, he has also had some experiences at the uh, Bledsoe House, and he's here to um, um, ask some questions and interact with, with Ryan. The thing that interests me most about um, Bob is that in 1991, I and a guy by the name of T. Scott Crane wrote a book called UFOs, MJ-12, and the Government. In that book, we had a whole chapter on the Institute for Defense Analysis. We had a chapter on the Jason Group, and we had a, a chapter on DARPA. And I know what the Institute is. I know how powerful this Institute is. And anybody uh, that um, knows will know that uh, Bob McGuire is, is not a uh, staff secretary. I mean, anybody who is associated with that group is pretty powerful because I studied them, and I studied the connection, and I also studied... Uh, the rest of the book was all on Dr. Eric Walker, who was uh, chairman of the board and, and chairman emeritus at, at the Institute for Defense Analysis. So welcome, Bob, and I'm always glad to have you on because you have such a wealth of knowledge and uh, you ha have a great interest, but you have you know how the game is played in Washington. You know how intelligence works. So I'm glad to have you on, especially the fact that you have interacted with Chris and you intend to actually work with Chris, correct? That's correct. Yes. Chris and I have a date, which we set to start forever ago before COVID-19. COVID-19 seems like it's been 20 years long, but we uh, we were planning to start at the beginning of 2020 and COVID-19 got in the way. We were going to we were going to start together right after we attended U UFO Con and COVID got in the way. Beautiful. Uh, so I'm going to take over the screen. I'm going to go through some uh, we're going to show some photos because I took a lot of photos when I was there. I've got a lot of photos of, um, of um, stuff that Chris had sent me and also some videos. And we're going to go through them pretty quickly and we'll talk in the background. And so let me know if you can see my screen. Yep. <laughs> okay. Looks like my Facebook or something. Yeah. I'm just trying to get it to go full screen. Here we go. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, we're going to start with some um, just background, because a lot of times when the Bledsoe story is told, people hear it, but they really don't uh, get to see exactly what it looked like. I was there, and this is the Bledsoe house, correct, Brian? Yes, sir. And the, the, the tree that we're going to talk about in a second is in the back on the right-hand side. I think that was my rent-a-car that I had when I stopped there. And your, your grandfather, we'll talk about him in a second, uh, his house was on the left side, correct? So that there's two houses on the on the same property, correct? 
Correct. It, it was all my grandfather's land and we just built on that plot. Okay. And your father built the house, correct? You and your father? Uh, me and my father and my brothers and two cousins. Okay. And that's what I think a lot of people don't realize is that your father was a very talented guy. Now people think he's just some guy from North Carolina who had a UFO sighting. They don't realize that your father had a lot of stuff. And I'm just going to go through in a minute, but describe the family here. Here's your picture of your family. Can you describe who everybody is here? Yeah. So uh, from left to right, that's my mother. And then obviously that's me. Um, That's my, he's older than me, but he's the middle brother, Jeremy. And then to the right of him is Chris Jr. He was the one who was there um, during the Fayetteville incident. Then you have my, my younger sister, Emily, and then obviously my father on the right. But I'm, I'm the youngest boy, but I'm not the youngest child. Okay. And all your family had experiences. And I, I appreciate when I was there in 2013, you were very hospitable. Um, all the kids could talk to me. Uh, even Chris had really not talked. Uh, he spent some time uh, telling me what was going on in the background. He'd never talked about it before. And I do appreciate the fact that you did share with me. Everybody interacted. It's uh, I think Bob knows this. It's a family that uh, just gives and gives and gives and is open to everybody that comes along, no matter you know what maybe what their agenda is. They try to help. Right. Now, your father was your father did a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I pulled some of this stuff. He showed me some of this stuff. I mean, he had uh, all sorts of talent to build stuff, motorcycles. He had these racing planes that he had. He had right. a he had a commercial pilot's license. He had a company that was doing, I think, 18 to 20 million dollars a year building houses. Yeah. People don't realize this was not this is not a guy off the street that was that was doing this kind of stuff. He was into cars. He, he could literally he, build he anything. Built that. Yeah, he built that. And and, and the other thing I asked him about was the plane. He, he had said he'd built a plane. I said, oh, did you build it from a kit? No, I just built it. <laughs> yeah, well, he <laughs> built like, the chopper that you showed. He built that from the ground up when I was a little kid and the hot rod and the plane. Wow. Yeah, see, he's multi-talented and had that big shed. When I was there, he was working on a boat. He, they were building or re- redoing a boat in that big shed there behind your father's house there. So very talented guy. And people don't realize that Chris Bledsoe is is a very, very talented, skillful guy. One of the things that, that um, I remember he gave me, and this was um, um, a, a beam, what's called, we call a beam photograph. Chris sent me the first one in 2015. This is the first one that I think actually exists. Uh, uh, some people say they've seen beam photographs before. Chris sent me this one. And then suddenly they started appearing all over the place. This is Illinois. Uh, this is uh, just outside of Phoenix. Wow. This is, um, this is Macedonia. This is Hong Kong. This is uh, Scotland. People started filming this thing all over the world. And I think you had these experiences as well, that w- what it comes down to, and Bob saw the orbs, that there are orbs, and then there's this mist that I'll show you some photographs were taken around the tree. And then you have these beam photographs. And you, what you have is people around the world are all getting the same thing. They're getting the, the orbs, the mist and the beam photographs and whatever it means, I don't know, but it, it, Chris was the first one to give me this beam photograph, which I thought was really cool, really cool until I started seeing other people's beam photographs. So Chris has been, we've been in contact probably since 2012. We've interacted through the years and he's always been kept me up to date with what's going on. A lot of times he wouldn't talk to me because I was Canadian. So I, he would wait till I come to the States and he would show me a bunch <laughs> of stuff, but this is one. Is that you in the in the photograph, or is that that's that's Chris Jr. That's Chris and Jr. my dad. And, he, mm-hmm. and here's this this um, you have the orb stuff is appearing, and you have this this uh, this mist start to appear. Now the it's important. The beam, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. It's important to note that uh, this is the night that Jim Simi Van was at our house. Okay. So did, did Jim I, see I wanna, the orbs? I also, let me also yeah. point out, Grant, that the mist is not visible right. anywhere except in the photograph. Yeah. Right. Interesting. And and Chris sent me a number from the days. I've just showed this one, but he even had some with the mist during the day where we mm-hmm. photographed this uh, sort of whatever it is. So there were, there were, people got to realize there's a lot of activity and we'll get into this in a minute. But there was a lot of people coming to that tree, both for healing yeah. and for investigation. People are coming from all around the all around the world. In you fact, there's a people. woman who had cancer here in Winnipeg who actually made a trip down there to uh, to visit Chris. Right. Now I'm going to go through some of the videos and we can sort of talk in the background. These are the things that, that Bob's going to sort of be looking at. And these are some of the videos that Chris has sent me just in the last couple of months. He's got a lot of videos and I think you can confirm he spends a lot of time outside uh, mm-hmm. watching. 
And so here's some of the, the, the videos. And this is taken with a psionics low light level camera. Right. Look how bright she's getting. Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Very bright. As it went right over. Notice you can see the trees illuminated. That's from the psionics low light level camera. Prior to his getting the psionics camera, this is from Joel Griffin of UAP Research has loaned it to Chris. You couldn't tell the context in Chris's videos. Now with a low light level camera, you can see the trees in the background. Okay. This one takes a little while to get going, but he's, it does appear here. It's always good that he, <laughs> And this is at a new place. You're, you're not at the old house. You're at a, off a, right. yeah, a pond area. Yeah. Came up, turned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's catch it. Here's the next one. I think I got two more. Okay. Dude, my hair is so like your butt. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. It's coming directly because of the prayer. This is for, this is over my house, look, it's a little shit, right here. Thank you, thank you Lord. This is for David Rader, Sarah, tonight and our project, Bob, Lori, everyone. I wish I could, this is up on 10, it's about 10, 10.30, this is, the the making it go full screen sort of wrecks the shot a little bit but this is the last one what is this bob you, you know what this one is oh well it's two passed right by each other to whatever these things are that Chris calls them angels. Okay. This is the tree. Um, half the top of the tree fell off. It started to die. This is from the one side, the, the side that didn't burn. But um, we're going to get to Ryan's video. There's, I think there's what I consider two real famous videos that I saw. One that Chris showed me in Maine one time, and that's the one that I think, Ryan, you've talked about in an interview where this, uh, this being or whatever it is comes across the yard and then lights up. And that was one that I saw. And the other is the famous one is yours. And I'm going to show your video tonight, which I think is something that a lot of people really haven't seen is the actual event where the tree burns. So maybe you can tell a little bit of a background on how this uh, what happened in terms of uh, Chad and Carrie Hayes, which I think I've got a photo of them. There's right. actually, we should mention, there was, there was rings that appeared under the tree first. Then the top of the tree started to die. And here's Chris Jr. and the, the ring, and this is almost right below the tree. Yeah, so actually, um, you know, my grandfather has lived on this property my entire life. And, yep, that's the Hayes brothers. Um, the tree was dead ever since I was a child. It was always just this dead tree with no branches. And after it caught on fire is 
it grew. It, it came back to life, all the leaves, all the brush, all that uh, was, was from the fire event, which is weird in and of itself. But, um, you know, the rings happened in 2007. Was it January 8th, 2007? Yeah, so those rings were there for many years. And if you go back to that tree photo, you see that he had tilled the property and he made a garden. Yeah. So there, there's weird phenomenon with our yard and how it grew and it was dead for many years. But the tree itself caught fire. Um, Diana Pasolka, who, you know, for your listeners, if they don't know, she wrote American Cosmic. She had met Chad and Carrie Hayes, who are these wonderful twin brothers from Hollywood. They wrote The Conjuring 1 and 2. This was their uh, independent project. They created it. They deserve the credit, in my opinion. Diana worked with them at the, UN, uh, the University of Wilmington here, where actually where I live is in Wilmington, helped them consult for the film, got to be really good friends with them. And they mentioned to her that they were interested in UFOs. So she said, well, I know a guy named Chris. I just met him this year. You know, I'd like to introduce you. She calls my dad and he says, I'm not really interested after the documentary. I don't want anything to do with Hollywood. So she says, okay, well, they'll be here till like Thursday or Friday, something like that. He says, if anything changes, I'll call you. Then the tree catches fire. And the next morning he says, Diana, I'm going to come meet them. So it was, it was like a sign. That's kind of a condensed version of the story, but in a nutshell, uh, he was looking for a reason to meet them. The tree catches fire. And then he's in the car on the road to Wilmington. It's about an hour and a half drive. Um, and, well, and I would, to make, so whatever caused the fire wanted to make darn sure yes. they were certain it was weird because they put it out multiple times yeah. all the way to cold and it yeah. caught fire again. Yeah. Three times yeah. Three my mother times. put it out with water. Yeah. So it, go ahead. Well, I, the, the one thing I had heard that, that um, Mel Gibson had wanted to do a movie on this thing <laughs> and that he had uh, wanted a sign. Was that true? And in, in connection with this that's movie? partially true. That's partially true. Yeah. So these guys, Chad and Carrie Hayes, very wonderful people. They were friends with Mel Gibson and probably still are. And yeah. when they were discussing the original project, which was going to be a movie, um, they had Mel Gibson in mind to play my father, but that never panned out. And they've said a few names here and there, like Russell Crowe, Mel Gibson, um, some other- Julia Roberts. Names. Julia Roberts, I heard. <laughs> no, well, for my mother, they actually were considering Vera Farmiga, who, who did The Conjuring. Now, of course, they never got to the point to ask her, but that, that's who they had in mind. Um, so the Mel Gibson thing was a partially true rumor, but it, it never got that far in production. And we're still, even this week, we're in contact with them. The whole thing is at every turn, they've been denied at the pitch. It's like someone's coming in and saying, you know, this isn't right or something of that nature, but they're, they're still working on it. And COVID has slowed things down. At one point we were um, in talks with Jordan Peele, who many people will know who he is. Uh, he did get out, you know, like Key and Peele. At one point, he was going to make it. And then he got so Oscar famous from his film, he had to back out because of other engagements. Okay. Wow. Fascinating. Now, here's again the, the tree. This is the burning side of the tree. And again, you can see this uh, mist stuff that will appear in a lot of orb photographs. And here's, the, here's your yeah. video here. So let's give me a background Grant, before I Grant, play the video. Grant, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Back up one. Notice the tree is stuffed with gifts people have sent Chris clothing. looking for a blessing. Yeah, yeah. clothing. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and once I, again, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, once again, in this photo, there's no visible smoke. I mean, we're not sitting outside, you know, smoking yeah. cigars by the tree. <laughs> so people say that. They say this is cigar smoke. Well, yeah, your, your father did get sort of a rumor of being able to heal people. Um, and I was in, I will tell you, I was in Maine with him. Um, Tyler D was involved. There was, there was, there was, uh, it was I don't want to get the details because I don't, I would get the details all mixed up. But he actually did heal a woman who had lost her hearing. She had a stroke and uh, Chris was standing out front. And th this message comes from Tyler D that says, if you happen to be outside and somebody needs a healing, go ahead and do it. And you know what your dad does? He really doesn't know what to do. So he just put his hands on her ears and said, in the name of Jesus. And she comes out of my lecture yelling, I can hear, I can hear a yeah. woman under 70. So can you talk about this uh, thing where your dad sort of got this reputation of being able to heal people? Well, if my memory serves correct, it started with you, with, uh, with the dog, which you're very well aware of. I'm sure yeah. your viewers know about this, but you know, the dog's neck was uh, nicked. 
and she was bleeding and you were there. I mean, you can correct me on the details. Yeah. Basically he puts his hand on her. He takes it off and she's healed. Yeah. And he just thought about it. And he said, I think these beings want me to help people. And wow. he, he, my father will never say that he has the ability to heal. What he says is, is these beings using him to help people. He said, he gives it all to them. He says, it's all them. But um, yeah, I mean, many people have come to our house and have been healed of various diseases. Like um, and I know you had a friend that came to our house. Yeah. Um, I still have the pen she gave me to put on my hat, the little Canada pen. Okay. I cherish that. Um, we've had friends come and get healed of various cancers. To this day, people are sending clothing to my father just, just for healings. And, and, and a lot of them get those healings. So when my wife and I visited, she had right side weakness, uh, sh uh, right foot regularly scraped the ground, and her right arm was weak because she had had a stroke the year before. And within two weeks of us uh, visiting Chris and uh, him doing whatever it is he does, the right side weakness disappeared. Wow. Yeah, you had, you had some experiences that made you a believer as well. And that's the key is that when you're there with him, it's one thing to hear the stories. But when you're around him and this stuff starts to happen, it's like, wow, you always got to make sure you got your camera in your hand because you never know right. what's going to happen when you're around Chris. Well, okay, so Ryan, and, Ryan and Chris and I deserve observed a, a large, massive, really bright, much brighter than Venus orb move across the sky right over the top of our heads. And Ryan got not a great, but a video of that orb. Right. And then, of course, out of respect to you, I've never released the video, but um, I still have it. And, and the most astounding thing about the video is not the orb, but it's how excited we are to see it. You know, oh no, I, I, we're, I, we're pumped up. I can uh, never, I don't yeah. care. I, Brian, I don't care if you release it, you can release it. Okay. There you go. Okay. So set up your famous video. This is a video that okay. a lot of people haven't seen. Uh, okay. So describe to, and this is what year is this, uh, the fire ticket? 2012. I okay. posted it in 2013. You'll see that on YouTube. I sat on it for a year. I never thought anybody would watch it. So what happened, I, I touched on it a little bit earlier and, and I know you've covered it many times, but it, it was essentially the tree just caught on fire, it spontaneously combusted. It's important to note that Chase Klotsky actually came to our house and took samples from the tree and sent them to MIT. And MIT concluded that there were no known combustibles or accelerants in the tree. They, wow. they couldn't conclude why the tree caught on fire. So it caught on the inside, as you can see in the photo, and it only burned on the inside. It never spread on the tree. It was a dead old tree. My entire childhood, it was, it was just a rotted out tree. And then again, after the fire, it bloomed and it became this huge um, tree full of life. So we're outside. It's like my dad's birthday. It's, it's definitely in October. Um, the day before it had rained, so the grass was very wet. It did not rain the day that the tree caught on fire. We were outside having a birthday party for my father at my grandpa's house. About nine o'clock, we walk next door to go home and we're somewhere. And, and Grant, you've been at our house, you know, at, at our back section of our house, we had that glass door and windows and you could just see the backyard entirely. Our house was like a square. And we're standing at the back door and I had my iPad in hand. Um, I got it for college and I just loved playing games on it and always having it around me. And my mom or my dad looks outside and they said, oh my God, the tree's on fire. And they just run out there and I had my iPad and I'm like, well, I'm going to go record it. So I sprinted outside and we were just freaking out. I mean, we were yelling. We never thought anybody would see it. You know, um, I recorded the, the video and then I recorded one video, which is also on my YouTube of my mother putting the tree out and she put it out. I want to say three times through the night and it burned all night. Her last attempt at putting it out was three or four in the morning. And she finally just gave out and went to bed. It kept relighting itself. I remember she telling me, she said, I was out there at three o'clock in the morning, yep. putting this tree out. And I thought, if this tree falls over and I get killed, they're not even going to find me till the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's the video. Here's your famous video here. Okay. This tree just spontaneously combusted in our backyard. It was, yeah. This is so weird. There's Emily coming home. It has been thundering or lightning or nothing. No. Today. I don't even think it rained today. Here we go. We're all standing. We've all been standing out here looking. Ran as fast as we could in the backyard. The tree just spontaneously combusted.
We don't know. So the fire is like spiraling on the inside of it. It's the inside of the tree. No one knows, man. Okay. Beautiful. This tree is Oh, I should have played that one. Now, this one, I don't know if you've seen, Ryan. Uh, a number of years back, let's go back here. i got to do this. What's going on here? A number of years ago, your father showed me a video. This was filmed in Florida, and it doesn't come when you you expand it. If you go on YouTube, you can see it much clearer. Um, but this is a film. We don't know if this was hoaxed or what happened, but your father sent it to me. And you remember the story, we'll, we'll get in a minute, we're at the bottom of the, the river, they come up there to the top of the uh, the contractors, your your brother and your father, and they get to the top of the hill, and the road is blocked by this UFO sitting in the middle of the road, and they're right. forced to sit there and um, wait to see what's going to happen. When your father saw this, he said, this is the closest thing that he's ever seen to what that UFO looked like. And this is taped in Florida in 2011. Yeah. Now, the I-10 video. You seen it? I-10. Yeah, Highway I-10. Yeah. Are you playing here? Come on. He talked about the, the sort of like the flame, the the um, flames, the sort of the tongues of flame that were rolling right. around the object, and I guess that's what he's referring to here. Right. Very very bizarre looking thing. We don't I, know. I don't think. Did you ever find out who taped this? No, we never did. But I've actually seen something like that as well. Um, I talked about it on the Jimmy Church interview I just did. But I, um, I was 15 years old, and me and my dad saw something like this together. So you can't really put it into words. Yeah, very bizarre. Whatever this film is, it's very, very, especially when your dad said, this is it. He just, in fact, I asked him just a couple months ago, I said, remember that film? Where's that film you told me that was the one that looked like it? Yeah. Very bizarre. Okay. This is the river. Um, I just want to show this so people have a, an idea. This is the Cape Fear River, correct, where the incident occurred? Mm-hmm. And this is the uh, area, the fire pit area, where your brother saw the the beings with the color of the moon with the red eyes. Right. So just for people that they know that this area actually exists, what it looks like, because people hear about it, but they don't really. Right. This one here. So let's go to the, the night of the incident. It's Elvis's birthday, 2007. Uh, your dad and Chris come home. There's all this activity. They end up in a cornfield. Your dad suddenly doesn't have to take his uh, medication or Crohn's anymore. Yeah. And the next day you come home. Can you go through this story with your father, with your grandfather? Sure. Where you you come off the bus and uh, your grandfather greets you and, and you find out that something's happened. Yeah, I just want to say real quick, um, this photo here was the last time I ever saw my grandfather. He died two days later. But um, anyway, it's unrelated. It just brought something up in me. But when I, when I was 13, I get off the school bus. It's a normal day of school. And, you know, my grandfather was my next door neighbor. And at this time, I was trying to bond with my grandparents. And I would go sit with them every day after school and watch The Young and the Restless because it's what they like to do. And I get there this day and my grandpa tells me, basically, my father had been smoking dope and he saw a little green booger man. He said, boy, your dad's crazy. He's, you know, high, high on dope. He's seen green booger man. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, your, your dad smoked dope and he saw little green men. You need to go talk, talk to your dad. And when I went home, I spoke to dad and he was, he was definitely not high. I mean, he was um, totally coherent. He was panicked because of what had happened and he just wanted to talk about it, but he was calm in the sense that he, he was of sober mind. 
at 13, I, I was able to recognize that. My brother, Chris Jr. was very disturbed. Um, you've met him, uh, yeah. Grant. You yeah. know, he, he's, he's not easy to talk about this with, is he? Yeah. In fact, I think it was, it was your dad was sort of isolated after it happened. Your mother didn't want him talking about it. And, right. I, and I understand your brother actually was in his room with, with the door locked for a, an extended period of time that, that yeah. he, really, he really sort of didn't handle it very well. Even yeah. when I was with him, and that was 2013, I think that was really the first time he really talked. And he talked until his girlfriend came out and then he, he, he stopped talking. He, yeah. he was still very, very, and it was just because your father said, Grant's come a long way. I want you to talk to him. He's come this distance. And he did tell me some stuff, but he was very, very nervous when he was talking to me about this thing. As if he thought, he, I think he even said to me, every time I talk about it, it comes back. And he yeah. was, so he was very disturbed. And yet your grandfather, uh, in, uh, and uh, I think I mentioned to you before we did the interview, that your grandfather, I remember I talked to him when I was there. Right. And I still remember him saying, it's the old thing that when you've had the experience, you suddenly believe. Because he was sitting in that, that, that uh, swing set that he was sitting in there. And he said to me, he says, you know what? He says, you know, what? the day I saw that tree burning, I knew my son was telling the truth. <laughs> so yeah. it was sort of like a wake up call, the burning tree for your. And then I think they did have a sighting, correct? Later on, over top of your grandfather, we actually did see something during the day, correct? Yes. Uh, my grandfather had cancer. Just before he actually died, he suddenly died of a heart attack. But about a year and a half before that, he had some other complications and we thought he was going to die. So we, we went through a couple near deaths with him at the end and then finally he passed. But before he actually died, you know, with the cancer, we thought he was a goner and his cancer just went away. The doctors were baffled. My father had been praying for him and I can't remember who I wasn't there on the patio, but it, it was either my father or my grandmother. I can't remember who did it, but one of them stood up when they got the news that my grandfather was healed and said, thank the Lord. Okay. And, on the other, and on the other side of their hand in the sky, when they moved their hand, there was an orb and they all saw it. And at some point, a different time, a giant owl, well, I mean, all, all owls are huge, but just a big owl flew in across the back porch and flew by my grandfather around the time of this healing of the cancer. And um, it, it, it was also crazy. My grandpa believed then for sure that something had happened. And then of course he suddenly died. Um, but when he almost died back when he was in the hospital for upwards of 60 to 90 days, he had, ex he had a near death experience. He, he kept seeing himself on a boat. He said that I'm on a boat and the spirits are guiding me towards the light, but I'm not ready to go yet. So in the end of his life, he knew that this was spiritual. He knew his son was telling the truth. He supported my dad. And um, it was a major turning point for my father. Yeah. You, you mentioned owls. Uh, um, how many owls did you see? I'll, I'll mention a story that I had when I talked to Chris about owls. But was there a lot of owl stuff going on? Yes. The, the day of my grandfather's funeral, obviously, my father and my mother and then my siblings, we rode in a limo to the, um, the church. And we saw owls that day and it was, it was a rainy, dark, dreary day. And we saw owls perched on the trees, which is, is very rare to see an owl in your community. You know, it's not a common thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember I was talking to him and I probably shouldn't tell the story. I thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> Chris didn't think it was that funny, but he, he, I said, Chris, did you have owls? And he said, Oh yeah. He said, there was one sitting on top of the CB radio tower. And you know that your father was sort of isolated. Yeah. <laughs> and he had bought himself a CB radio and he was yeah. really basically not talking to anybody in the house, but he was talking to these people on CB and he bought yeah. this hundred foot tower. And he said, the owl used to sit on top of the tower. It did. And then, and then the, and then I, and then the, the house, you know, got struck by lightning and the tower got yeah. hit. And Chris had gone to the front door when just before this happened. And he said, if I'd been sitting in the chair, I would have been dead. And I yes. said, well, oh, that's why the owl was there. It, wa it, wa it wanted you to, to get up and tell the story and you didn't do it. So I burnt the house down. <laughs> he said, no, <"I> didn't. <laughs> but he said that y'all used to sit on top of that tower. It did. Kind of it did. Dad built that tower himself. Yeah. Yeah. You're, that's the thing. Your father could do almost anything. He was really skillful. He sent me this one just a while ago. This was a, a sketch that he made in 2010 that he only just recently found of the beings. And you, they have the red eyes. I remember when I was talking to Chris, we were at the back, and I remember your dad and Chris were having sort of a sort of a discussion about did the, the blinds go up and down like this or did they go like this? And your dad was yeah. saying they're going like this, and Chris said, No, they're going like this. And they had so describe this this idea with the yeah, the, 
these beings. And I think I've got a photo this one here. Yeah. So my brother has maintained from the night that he first told me about this back in 2007, that their eyes blink like camera shutters. He's, he says they go like this. They don't blink in synchrony. Um, and this being, uh, as you see, I, I, I misspoke on the Jimmy Black, or excuse me, fade to black with Jimmy. I've got COVID brain. So I've got, <laughs> I've got a, fo- I had COVID and it's just made me have some brain fog. So I apologize about that. Okay. Um, on fade to black with Jimmy Church, I said, you know, my dad saw the triangle. My brother saw the triangle. Well, my dad corrected me. My dad was the only one who saw the triangle. So when my brother saw them, they were running around. They were like running on all fours. My dad saw it standing still and he could see the detail vividly. That's why my dad drew the triangle. So these beings appeared that original night. Two of them had my brother um, stuck in the woods. They kind of had him, I don't know, hypnotized or paralyzed. Yeah. When, um, whenever they looked at him, he couldn't move. That's he couldn't, he couldn't move for hours. Was, he was, one was doing picking up those beer cans in that fire pit area. And right. as long as one was looking at him, he couldn't move. Correct. And it made sense to me because it was like, you know, he probably would have shot him or, you know, like that. Yeah. The protection thing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, on top of that, he said they could run on all fours, like fast, like a dog. Um, And and at at one point in the story, as you know, because you've been to our house, you've heard it firsthand. When they were leaving, my brother, my dad didn't hear this for years, but my brother turned around. My dad was driving the truck and he saw one of these beings on all fours run up and jump on the tailgate of the truck. Yeah. Yeah. As they're going up. I remember right. him telling me that he said, I remember him saying to me, he says, Grant, I have seen almost every animal in the world. <laughs> Nothing could run as fast as that thing was coming. And yeah. it was on all fours. And so he, and that was the thing. That's the kind of stuff that really rattled your brother. Is yeah. this thing turning from these beings looking like this to almost like an animal that was mm-hmm. moving at very high speed and trying to grab onto the back of the truck as they were driving up this hill. It right. was like, almost, and that, you could see why the Warner brothers would want to do a movie. <laughs> well, fascinating fascinating story and and yet i asked him i said well what happened when it i asked your dad i said well what happened when the thing went to grab for the back of the truck and he said i don't know it's like it's like that story just ended nobody knows what happened yeah. whether the being got in the back of the truck or what i don't know well as you know grant dad saw one of those later that night at the house so i don't know maybe it hitched a ride yeah. um yeah and and i think some of the contractors saw the red eyes in the back of the bush Yes. He dropped off this contract. And I think your mother saw the red eyes. Apparently she was driving. She was cutting the lawn one time. Yes. She saw the red eyes in the the bush because your mother didn't want anything to do with this, which makes sense. Because I remember talking, we're going to talk about Tyler D. I remember talking to Tyler D on the phone one time and I was really shocked when he told me his daughter would have nothing to do with this. Yeah. And, And he said to her, he said, just remember where the Lexus comes from. (laughs) <laughs> and, and Grant, he told me that this. in my house he told me that same thing just remember <laughs> yeah. where your lexus comes from <laughs> yeah yeah and, and people think that it's that you're going to get all the support and people don't realize like yeah, unless you really have the experience it's very hard to sort of grasp it and some people for whatever reason are busy with their life or they you know just not interested right yeah the, the triangle talk a little bit about the triangle because we're going to show the piece of metal at the end with the triangle on sure. it but yeah, what's the importance so, um, of the triangle well, he sees the triangle and, you know, these beings, they're, they're in my mind, I've seen one as an apparition in my room. In my mind, they are um, metaphysical. They're not purely just robot and they re- represent metaphysical things as my father understands it. And the triangle is the symbol of creation. It has the three points, um, the, the three sides, the three aspects of creation. And it was actually Tyler D., who put my dad onto this idea that they know that these beings communicate in symbols and that they mean things. And when Tyler showed up uh, one of these times at our house or, or when he was with my dad at some point, he had an Ouroboros on his shirt. And, and for the viewers who don't know what the Ouroboros is, it's a serpent. It's like the old North Smith, the serpent that is around the world and it eats its own tail. And it's like the wheel of infinity and death and rebirth and all that good stuff. And Tyler told my father that the triangle pointed up and the triangle pointed down merged together represent the male and the female forces in creation. And as my dad understands it, he was um, told by the lady that she is the third part of the Trinity, the mother or whatever it's been suppressed. This is what she said that it's been suppressed from us um, that there is a mother goddess aspect of the Holy Trinity. So that's kind of what he understands the triangle is, is this the three aspects or the three points of creation, 
the mother, the father, and then the son, which if you want to think about that, we're the son, we're the creation. Well, wow. yeah, you, you make an interesting point that I've always brought up about the UFO thing that it, it, the, it may be a lot less physical, exactly what yeah. your father is saying, than people, that, than people think. Because what Chris told me, you know the story when he first saw it, went through the bush, he sent mm -hmm. the dog in and he went racing around the other side. And as the thing, he was on that tree that died, that big oak tree, the whole tree died. He's, he's, he's catching his breath. He's got his hand on the tree. And that's when this thing appears. And he said it was close enough that he could touch it. And right. the being made this thing, I won't hurt you. And is looking. And as the dog came, the being just disappeared, which would indicate it may not be a flesh and blood type being. It can go into back to wherever it is. Right. It's, it's, and that's why I think the point your father makes and maybe takes a lot of static for it, where I back him up. This thing is going to be a lot less physical than I think people think it is. Yeah, and that's a good point. And most people don't know this. I say this a lot on Twitter and I get flack for it, whatever. I mean, I'm, I know this story. I'm my, I'm my father's son. I've heard it many times. Yeah. And one thing that my father experienced that he's never said publicly to my knowledge is that the tall beings, the seven, eight foot tall beings or whatever, when they took him to the lady, um, they were wearing hoods. And when they took off these hoods, they were made of pure radiant light. He hasn't said that, but it happened. So in my father's interpretation or an hour experience, whatever you want to call it, they're not purely physical beings. They could be physical. Just like if I programmed a video game, I could program myself in and play by your rules, but I don't have to. Yeah. That's how I see these beings. Yeah. This goes to the idea about the, the idea that the universe may be, just an action inside consciousness mm -hmm. or like a video game or like a right. projection or something like that. So these are the guardians. Can you describe the, what, what your description of your father, what the guardians are? Uh, and again, it's, it's not like they're really from some planet there. They have a higher mission. What's, what's the, what your father tell me. And these are the ones that he drew. And I remember when I was at the house, he had never taken these paintings out. I was there in 2013 yeah. and he went and got them to show me the paintings and then he said, oh, Yvonne would never let me put them up on the wall. And she said, you're darn right, you're not putting them up on the wall. So he had them in storage and he brought there them up to show me. Nobody had ever seen these photos. Right. So you, you just want me to go through the general description of these Well, things? the idea of the guardians to describe, okay. you know, this whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So for the viewer that's not well acquainted with the story, I'll just do a, a synopsis of that there. When he had his original experience in 2007, he, he had a lot of it consciously, like seeing the little short being, he remembered that consciously, but interacting with these beings, he did not first remember consciously. He had missing time, about four hours. All the, the four other people, the contractors and my brother, they corroborated this and they maintained it. And my dad just got this block in his head. He couldn't talk about it. It gave him headaches. Even though he walked up the hill, it was daytime. And then he walked down, it was about 11 PM. He's not thinking that he's thinking we're being invaded, right? So he meets with Dr. Michael O'Connell, MUFON or whoever flew him in to give my dad a regression. And during the regression, he, he had an hour and a half of recall of being with these beings on board their chariot, throne, UFO, whatever you want to call it, whatever culture you come from, uh, kind of like a throne. And they told him that they were the guardians, that they tend to all of life, like a terrarium, that they work for creation. And they, well, I don't know if I should say that part. Um, no. I got to be careful. If my father hasn't said it. I don't know if I should. Yeah, no, okay, good. No, you don't have to. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So um, they told him that they can pull your soul out of your body and take you on a journey and teach you lessons. They can leave your body in your bed at night, yeah. grab your soul while you're asleep next to your wife and take you somewhere, you yeah. know, take him to Egypt or whatever. They said that they can... That, that, that the physical world is not an obstacle to them, that they can appear from your light bulb, they can speak in your mind, they can do anything, and that they're here to guide us like they created us and like we're, not like they're children, but in that sense that they're here to help us. And that they, they said, don't worry about your son, he's okay. And they healed him of his Crohn's. So when he saw the lady in, in 2012, he saw them again, but this time was conscious. He consciously recalled them. This was a waking experience. It was not a regression or, or a, a regressed experience. And when he saw them, they had hoods on and it was, I, I believe it was three of them. And he said he feels familiar when he sees them, like they're his brothers or his friends. And when they pulled off their hood, they were pure light. They were non-physical. That They appeared in this form. In my opinion, they appeared in this form 
to give him that association with UFOs, aliens, whatever. But this is this is not their form. Their form is light. Wow. And I'll, I'll just give you a little story I had gotten was Brett Oldham. If you've ever read the book, The Children of the Greys, Mm-mm. he's encountering the Greys and he has no friend of the Greys. He's very upset with them. He talks to the tall Grey and he said, what's your concept of God? And the tall Grey said, we are one with the one who is all. And Brett Oldham said he was so he was so floored he had to go sit down he couldn't he was sort of overwhelmed and and you mentioned the Michael O'Connor interview one of the things I sort of point out to people interesting is that this is a lifetime experience your father had because I remember Michael O'Connor asked him when did you first encounter these beings he said they have been with me since before I was born yeah and, that's and, what I was thinking I shouldn't say but I guess yeah, yeah, yeah. it's in it's in the transcript the transcript <laughs> okay, is well there. okay well I guess I'll go ahead and and touch on that then they, uh-huh. they told- I'll take the rap for it. The other thing that they said was the <laughs> the the fact that they asked Michael O'Connor asked them, "Were they with you when you got shot?" I don't remember the exact expression, and he yes. said yes, yes, as if they had saved his life when he got shot with a shotgun at nine years old in the in the forest there. Yeah, and so this is this idea that that he's sort of like, um, and you'll you'll get this with experiencers now, is that it's like a lifetime agreement that this is not random, yeah. this is not he was at the wrong place at the wrong time that he's on some sort of role or mission or whatever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's important to point out that Chris had, from the time he was young up until he uh, got done with Crohn's, he had multiple near-death experiences. Yeah, Yeah. at least two. And Bob, you're like, you've you've gone back in your life and you suddenly realize this may be your case as well. That when you look back in your childhood, there are memories that indicate um, you may have had lifelong contact and it helped you become who you are. So my mother tells me that the doctors told her that I, when I had uh, cerebral meningitis, uh, sorry, encephalitis, yeah. I had, I died three times wow. and was out for a while and was resuscitated. But this was before I was one year old. I have no memory of this. My mother and others around her relatives told me this. Wow. And then you'll see, you'll see that often. Uh, I think it's the, the free survey, the Edgar Mitchell free survey shows 39% of all experiencers claim they've had a near-death experience. Right. And so the question is, is, is it a random event or is this a planned event? You know, you think, well, they, they've been abducted and then they've had near-death experience. What's the chances that this high percentage? And just because you're believing it's a random event and it may not be a random event. Well, I have something. So the the one other thing I would add about my experience: the doctors told my mother that it looked like I was going to live, but I was, I was going to be an imbecile and probably a cripple. And as you can see, I might be an imbecile, but I'm not a cripple. <laughs> <laughs> and and there are there are these uh, cases, a lot of cases where uh, there's a trauma event, whether it's a near death experience or like yours, where yeah. it's a like a brain sort of inflammation or a high fever, like even the, the, the discovery of the um, uh, origin of the species was, uh, it wasn't Darwin, it was the other guy, I can't remember his name was, but he had a huge fever. And that's when this idea came to him about the origin of the, the survival of the, the fittest. And then Darwin picked up on it, but you'll see this a lot in um, people who've had these trauma events who suddenly become very psychic or you know have these experiences. Well, I have something to add there, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I can't go into the specific details, but we, my father and I were made privy to a study um, where they are finding a correlation between real genuine experiencers and trauma. Wow. And that's all I can really say about that. But that's, yeah. that's, that's a real phenomenon, trauma associated with having experiences of this nature and they're aware of it and they have sample sizes and everything. There's a name for this, but I, I, I don't think that I should say it, but it's real. Yeah. I I've spoken about that a lot. I wrote about it in contact modalities that there's this very high percentage, even the idea that a being comes in your room. I always wondered like, why would it come into your room? Cause that's got to scare the living daylights out of you. I mean, it's like, it forces you to dissociate. It's like, Oh my, you know, like it yeah. flips you out of that shuts down the left brain and, or, or whatever, but there is that high correlation. Now, the orb thing, your father used to send me a lot of these orb things where there's there's beings inside the orbs. And that's the thing. You had, Your father took a lot. How many photographs do you think there are, Bob? Ooh, there's a thousand. I can tell you. Go ahead. 
I had my father's phone in my hand and I said, dad, let me see your old uh, folder. And he pulled it up and in that one folder on one device, there were over 15,000 photos. Oh, yeah, that 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 and he that and he has a has a storage drive with yeah. videos and photos. Look, it's thousands, as I as I've it's said, tens of thousands. Yes, and you're, it's, can it's you unreal. talk about can you talk about the analysis that you plan to do on on his stuff? Sure. So the, the some of his stuff is really, really you know kind of it would be weak evidence to anyone who is a skeptic. But he has other things that are that are more interesting they're in focus there's context in the background and the, so the videos uh joel griffin took uh, an adobe tool and got one of these videos and put one of these orbs in the center of it and you can tell the context in the background and the orb in the center and it was very stabilized and had these these odd little fingers poking out of it at a very high rate and so uh, I intend to apply super resolution and stabilization to the pictures and the videos. And uh, uh, in one of the more famous uh, pictures where Lori Wagner and I think the guy's name is Jason who was there and uh, Jason took a photo, photo of, or, of, of an orb right behind Lori. And in the, in the foreground of Lori, you can see an obvious kind of shadow shadowy looking person and in the background of the shadowy looking entity you can see another one that's in further along in the forest and i did all that by photo enhancement there's i didn't add anything to the photo i just enhanced the photo so that you could see it and it is now clear that it's one of chris's beings one of the tall ones wow fascinating your sister, um, all, all your family experience stuff. I remember this was on the wall when I was at your place. Your sister had drawn this. She must have been very, very young when she drew this. And I was just fascinated. And because I'm actually doing a series on UFOs and artists. There seems to be a, a lot of UFO people are very good artists. And your dad, I think, did the same thing. No, no. Your your dad actually was drawing hummingbirds. They were all over the yep. wall. And He's then this hummingbirds. one by, by your the sister. Flowers. Yeah. So this art thing, your sister's very artistic and you, all your kids, I think when I was there, I was talking about the shadow people, all the kids saw the shadow people, you heard the, the footprints and stuff like that. So you've yeah. all had these uh, experiences and you, can you talk, you just briefly mentioned it. Can you mention the, the incident where you encounter the one where it's translucent, the little small being with the eyes? Can you tell sure. that story? Yeah, so um, I, I was about, I don't know, 20, 21. So this was a number of years ago and I was in, so my brother moved off to college. So I used his room as like my hangout room, play games, whatever, have friends in there. And I had one of my best friends in there named Alex. And we were sitting in the room like this, where he's sitting facing this way. I'm sitting this way where we're looking at the same angle of the room. Right. So different chairs or, 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 seating arrangement, but we have the same line of sight, right? So we're talking and we're talking about this phenomenon. He was very interested in it, fascinated. And I felt something touch my ribs and I freaked out and my friend looked at me and he, he's like not knowing what to think. And I said, something just touched me and I lifted my shirt and there was a red mark on my ribs. It was about the size of a small hand. There were no finger indents like that. It was just like a mark like this, right? And I look at it and I'm freaked out and then we look up in the corner and there's a three to four foot being standing there. My friend and I both just whipped our heads over there. It's standing, it's fully translucent. It's like glass, but it had a border where we could see the shape. It was exactly like the painting that my father did of the little guy with the triangle. I didn't see the triangle. What I saw was the border of the being arms, legs, head. And I saw big round eyes, just circles. It was there for about two, three seconds. And then it just disappeared. Fascinating. We'll get to some of the other stories. The, your, your favorite story you told is the next one here. This was part of a painting that Doug Alt <laughs> did of the, the Shining Lady. Uh, and we'll get into that story about the lady coming, but part of it involved a bull. So right. let's tell your story about the cow. I just heard this, the last interview <laughs> you did, and it's one of the best stories I've ever heard. So tell me the story about you talking to your dad and the story of the cows. Okay. Well, it's important to note that the 2007 incident happened when I was 13 years old. So that's a young child. And this bull thing happened when I was 18. So that's five years from childhood to adulthood, right? 
So for these five years where we got hacked by MUFON and we didn't want to speak to the world publicly ever again, and it was, it was a little bit of darkness where we felt isolated from the world. And we kept having these experiences, a lot of poltergeist type stuff in our house with dad and Chris Jenner saw the beings a few times, all kinds of experiences, but we didn't share them, right? I never had anything at this moment that was face-to-face -face significant. I saw things in the sky. I saw the big gold thing. So I was telling dad one night, I said, dad, I really wish that I would have like a crazy experience. I wish it was me that was there that night. You know, Chris Jr. doesn't like talking about it. I love it. I want to hear all about it, all this, that, and the other. And he's, and I said, I want to see an alien. And he said, well, son, they're not aliens. I said, yeah, they are. Of course they fly UFOs. He said, no, they're not aliens. They're magical. They're spiritual. They, they mess with your destiny. They mess with your fate. They're not sitting up there spinning on a disc, listening to you with a telescope and a radio or whatever. They know your thoughts. They know what you're going to do before it happens and they guide you. And, and I'm like, where's he getting all this stuff? Well, he had just seen the lady, right? And it changed everything he knew about it. She told him things and put it in his head. And I said, dad, that sounds all cool and all, but I, I really just think they're aliens. And then I started hearing cows. I, I heard a cow um, start mooing, but it had no body. Now it's important to also note that our yard was fenced in. So our backyard was these tall blueberry bushes. As you've, as you've seen, the right side of the yard was fenced in by the Griffin's yard. The left side of the yard had a few acres of dense woods, as you've seen, you know, yeah. Yeah. there's no way a cow could have walked onto that property. Would you agree? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you've been there. So like yes. it just, it just a cow started mooing. We got in the car a day or two later and didn't find any cow farms for about five to 10 miles in any direction. So I hear the cow and I'm like, okay, dad, this is really weird. And then I hear another cow and one by one, they keep going off and they came on and off at different intervals to the point to where we heard a chorus of about five cows and they were mooing so loudly. My dad and I couldn't hear each other speak. And then after that was over, dad said, well, you had your experience. And I was ticked because I wanted to see a craft. I wanted to see one of these beings. And I got freaking cows moving at me and laughing at me, like just messing with me. So it, it wasn't funny to me then, but now it's obviously, it was meant to be that it happened that way. But I was yeah, in you, denial about it for years. Yeah, you mentioned that. I call that the theory of wow. Or some people call yep. it the, yep. the trickster phenomena where <laughs> they're, they're, they're just sort of playing. And they want, like I always say to people, why do UFOs have lights on them? So you can see them. They're yeah. flying around like yeah. when you saw these photographs, these photographs that your dad did of the videos, like, what are they doing? They're not doing anything. They're not picking up beer. They're not abducting anybody. <laughs> They're just like, here, here we are. Like, come see us. You know? yeah. and, and people are photographing and everybody's talking about it. And that's the, the idea with the cow. And I think you'd mentioned that before that, that that's what your dad's impression is, yeah. is that they're just sending like these signals to us and trying to indirectly, not directly come down and land on the White House lawn and tell us what's going on, but try, try yeah. to get our attention and give us indirectly the message. So you come to the conclusion. Is that, is that accurate? That is accurate. It's about consciousness and it's about belief. And they appear to you in a way to where it's up to you to decide if you accept it or not. Yeah. And they'll Sometimes give you they a make exceptions. Yeah. They make exceptions like the 2007 Fayetteville incident, whatever, but usually they appear in a synchronistic way where you're guessing for days what happened, but you know, it happened. And, and then you're down the rabbit hole forever. You can't, you can't forget mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Here's some of the orbs. Uh, here's one. I tried to pull the photo, the, the, um, <laughs> you, uh, you put this one on, uh, even though we can't see the objects, I tried to pull it right. and I couldn't pull the object, but yeah. this is your, uh, wife. And this is a, um, uh, you took a lot of static. I remember you put this on Twitter and a lot of people started to attack you and I came, you know, to your defense, but you, you've had your own experiences, Correct. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and so you had this one and you can't see it, but there is actually an object over on the uh, sort of on the horizon and you didn't intend to take it. He just showed up in the photograph. Right. Right. Yeah. We were just hiking in Asheville. North well, Carolina. Just tell, tell you that uh, while we're looking, no, you, you can go ahead to the next one. While we're looking at the owl and the tree, I want to point that out in the UFO over it. Um, the, the, there are many photos of this family with, uh, objects in the background, and one of the one of the ones that really kind of got to me was Chris was talking to Emily while she was off at school, and she had taken a picture of a very interesting building because her father is a builder, and she wanted to show him the architecture of the building, 
And uh, well, I'll tell you, it was in New York City. And I noticed something in the background on the tree. So we decided to, Chris sent me the photograph so that I could process it and looked at it. And I'm, many people here will have seen the movie Alien. <laughs> and the in Alien on the uh, rock where the bad things are uh, hatching eggs, there's this gigantic U-shaped uh, uh, alien spacecraft that had crash landed on that thing. And up there in the sky above Emily's head was one of these gigantic U-shaped craft right there in the background over New York City. And Emily had no idea it was there. But I'm just telling you, I've seen several pictures of all of the family with things in the background like that that they didn't know was there. Right. It's funny that you bring up the day my sister, you know, my sister lived in New York City. She went to, she actually is a student currently of New York University. She had to come home because of COVID, which is unfortunate. When she first moved out to New York University, she was uh, walking around the streets of New York City or she was like scouting out apartments or something like that. And she, in a city full of nine to 12 million people, bumped into Jim Simidan and his wife. This was this was not a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> and he doesn't even live in New York City, does he? No. He lives no. in Washington, right? In that area, yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, so this is a 2012. This is painted by Doug Alt. He took months mm -hmm. to paint this, based upon what Chris had told. And him. it's a large painting. It's it's human yeah. size. Yeah, and uh, that changes everything. And and I'll just make a point that. Within days, I have my awakening experience from this happened. Uh, my awakening experience is February 26, 2012. This happened within a, a it, week. It was, or a, it was Easter. Days. This was yeah. Easter. Yeah. And uh, so um, I've always had that relationship with Chris that seems to the synchronistic thing. And that changed everything for him. It moved from yeah. like an alien type thing to this angelic thing. And mine changed from nuts and bolts from presidential stuff to the idea where I was told this is consciousness. And, yeah. You know, yeah very clearly that got this message. So this is, we're not going to get much because this has all been, people have talked about this quite a bit, uh, but right. this is where the, the aspect where Chris has taken it twice to her once in, in, in the beginning of the year. And then he still doesn't do anything. And then he gets taken again to outer space. And she's sitting on the mountain on the side on this ledge. And she says to him again, you have a burden and it's yours to carry. So tell me what happens in 2013. So she's basically telling him, you got to go and tell the story. And then can you tell the story what happens? He goes to give this lecture in Asheville, North Carolina. <laughs> and that's when he gets discovered by Diane Posolka, right? Correct. So I went with him to that meeting in Asheville. I was at the time, you know, my, my older brother, Chris Jr., as you have experienced firsthand being an investigator on the scene, he's not really open as, as he is more now, but he wasn't open to talking about this. Yeah. Our brother, Jeremy moved off to college. So it was just me. So I would get in the car and I'd go with my dad. We drive to Asheville. Um, he saw the lady about a week before. And he says, well, I want to talk about this lady. And I'm like, great, dad, you know, they're going to love it. He gets there and he starts talking about the lady and they're heckling him. A crowd of 50 to 70, I don't know, it was less than 100. Uh, people were heckling him. We want to hear about the river. You know, he hadn't talked publicly for about five years at this point. We want to hear about the river. He said, well, I just saw a lady. I want to talk about that. And they are just really giving him a hard time. Just so happens Dr. Diana Pasolka was in the crowd. And she heard everything he said with open ears. And she approached me afterwards. She came and spoke to me. Hi, my name's Diana. This is my husband, Dan. Husband, um, uh, Dan. And we really liked what your father said. Something like, I don't know. It's been, it's been a long time. I don't remember exactly what she said, but it, it, was, pl it was positive. It was pleasant. It was, we'd like to meet up with you. By the way, I live an hour and a half from you in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I'm a professor. So I don't remember the exact details of our conversation, but um, yeah. It was pleasant and, and we got hooked up after that and you know that, yeah that's that, how we met her was at this random meeting and six hours away from both of our towns and and she turned everything around she's the one that yeah. sort of started bringing in people and mm -hmm. she was going to do a book on you that didn't pan out but you are a part of the uh, uh american cosmic i remember your dad telling me just to add a story when they started to harass him he said he heard the message come in his head Tell them there's going to be an event at the end of 2012 that's going to affect the election. 
Yep. And so he says that, and he just he just popped into his head. Earth and Earth. Hurricane Sandy came up the coast that 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 at the election, and they shut the polls down in New Jersey and New York because of the Hurricane Sandy. So these these predictions were coming in his head. Yeah. Well, he also said there was going to be an earthquake. Um, Baja California. Baja yeah. California, and it actually happened on yep. September September twenty fifth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that that's interesting. Where you hear these stories and. And that's the thing is when you're around your father, you're a very good spokesman for telling, identifying, because your father has so many of these very, very bizarre stories right. that unless you're there and you have experience, you just can't believe this stuff is happening. And But it is yeah, happening. And, and another thing to point out is, there, glad you brought that up. Uh, Chris introduced Tyler D to Diana Basalka. Yeah. yeah. Uh, originally, she was in the works about us with a book. And Tyler D said to my father, I, I, basically he was tasked to learn about the spiritual slash religious side of the phenomenon. And dad said, I know the perfect person. And he introduced him. And next thing you know, American Cosmic was born. Um, but it, it, it was going to be us at first. I, I don't know what, for what reason it wasn't, but it, it was initially about us. And she switched gears and went to Tyler. You know what she's well, doing? Look, for look, 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 Diana, Diana is a brilliant writer. Yeah. This book is extremely well written and it has had a major impact. Yeah. yeah. And, and published by Oxford Press, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. So it's not just, you know, a self published book. This was big time. I remember um, Kid Green, who was ran the Weird Desk at one point, said if you take off the first couple of chapters and the last couple of chapters, that's what I think is going on. Grant, so I just really... want to. Sorry, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Since that name has been spoken, I just want to bring our minds back to the study that I mentioned earlier and just presently acknowledge that there is an association there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. At least they're doing Kit Green and Gary Nolan are at least doing what you're supposed to do. And I say, if you want to understand how the UFO phenomena is about, you got to talk to the people who are interacting with the phenomena. There are people who are actually face to face interacting and are getting messages and it's time that people like your dad are respected and people start listening to what he's saying. And you can do light, de- you know, no, no, your dad had the lie detector. We won't do any more lie detectors, but you can do whatever you want. Be as skeptical as you want, but at least talk to the people. And instead of the way that it's handled now is, oh, it's just anecdotal. It's not really, it doesn't mean anything. It actually does mean stuff. And uh, I respect people like Tyler D and people like that who have interacted with your father to try to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Well, he's not the only one. Yeah. Well, we're going to do this. What we're going to do. So here's Tyler D. And, and I have met him. I have interacted with him. And uh, so let's t- tell some Tyler D stories. Uh, this is where I met him. This is a, in, a co- in a cabin in uh, Pennsylvania. Tyler was only there for a few hours. Uh, but the one question I want to ask you is, did he talk about time travel to you? Because I'll tell you the story that he told me. We were in there and he actually introduced me to an experiencer. So it was not just your dad he was following. He's following a bunch of experiencers. And the one girl that he put me in contact with used to live real close to me here in Manitoba, Canada. And he actually was on Tyler's phone. He phoned her up and I talked to her and I've interviewed her. I had not made the interview public. Uh, she's had a lot, Tyler watched her, the, the predictions she was making, all sorts of filling in stuff for him. And he, at one point during our conversation, he showed me a cell phone. I don't know if you've heard this story. He showed me the cell phone. He was showing me these, these paintings. And he said, what do you think about this? He didn't say this is real. This is not real. And um, I, I didn't know what he was showing me, these paintings. And, and, I, and then he said, do you know where that is? And I said, no, I don't know where it is. He said, that's the Hughes Aircraft Building. I still, I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea what you're talking about. And he said, that's where the jump room was. And then I went, what, what, what? <laughs> and I actually went when outside of LAX, it's the, the, the old Hughes aircraft. It's a, a, a building now with, with office buildings. I went there and Tyler said, watch out for the, uh, the guard. So I went there and eight o'clock in the morning and the guard was letting people in. And I went and photographed all the same stuff that Tyler had shown me. And then it was later on, I was thinking to me, I was thinking, why would Tyler show me those photographs? Why would he go to the building? I mean, if this is a, a bogus story, why would Tyler go to the yeah. building? And I started thinking maybe, and then I think I heard you say that he had made sort of some reference that this, that this may be true. It was an email. Um, he, was a, he was mysterious in the way that he revealed some things. And then in some ways he was not, and he flat out said it. And, and you know this, you've met him. He sent an email to my father and it was contextually about time travel in the sense that 
he framed it as a story about himself in his youth who had experienced an instance where he was brought five minutes into the past and he was baffled by it. And then the end of the email was something to the nature of, um, you know, this is the Nassau group or something like that. I mean, it's been many years, but he, he did in, imply to my father that they have technology. The guy who was in the group was um, the one that the doc from the Back to the Future is based on. T. Townsend Brown, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So it's yeah. like an elite group of super classified research, um, time travel, things of that nature. And, and he, he didn't outright say, I did this because that's classified, right? So he had a way to say it without saying it outright. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, this incident. Uh, we're going to show the medal later on, but you, you mentioned this incident in one of your interviews about Tyler uh, showing you actual metal where you right. there were two pieces of metal. I actually asked today, the, I, I contacted the girl that Tyler was working with. I mm -hmm. said, did he ever do that experiment with you? And she said, no, I don't, she doesn't recall ever doing that. But describe this experiment where he, you, you do the cycle logical thing where you're doing a blind test right. with Tyler and he's doing this thing with the metal which indicates and maybe for for people who don't know indirectly describe who Tyler is Tyler D okay there's a secret group of insiders researchers whatever you want to call them um, government type folks very highly classified um, daily life kind of thing like NRO NSA NASA that that whole deal and, and I might have got some of those groups wrong but they're they're black ops types people and they're called the invisible college yeah. they are written about in dr diana pasoko's american cosmic obviously they have aliases um, they came to us with their real names grant knows their name bob knows their name and out of respect to that i just don't say it but yeah. it's all over the internet he came to our house on the basis of learning if we were telling the truth or if we weren't, he wanted to know about this lady. My dad saw the lady. And then within a year, he was at our house. He had a laptop with a PowerPoint presentation that said for blood, so eyes only. And it had some photos of different facilities and things of that nature. And, and he asked us a lot of questions. He basically politely interrogated our family. He, he determined through this experiment that we were genuine experiencers. What happened was he had these two pieces of metal. Do you have the photos? I don't have the photos of that. Uh, I have photos of the metal, but not that metal, no. Right, like the honeycomb stuff? No, no, I don't have them. Okay, that's okay. So he had these little tiny tinfoil. They, they were very small. They were like little cornflakes. And he put one in my hand. And he said, tell me if you notice anything. And I felt it. And I was, you know, I was like 19, 20. I was, I was a kid at the time. And I was like, I don't know, this is kind of boring. I thought it'd be really cool, right? put the other one in my hand and I felt electricity through my body. It was a mild, pleasant, um, static charge when I held both pieces. And I said, Oh my gosh, I feel electricity. And he looked at me, he was really puzzled. And he said, okay, now we need to do the rest of your family. And I said, well, Hey, let me help you. You know, I I'm, I'm a psychology major. I'm all into like blind experiments. We're going to set it up in a way where they're coming in one by one and they're not primed to feel anything. And, you know, skip forward a little bit. We brought in my mom, my sister, both my brothers. We brought in my fiance who did not feel anything. We were newly dating at the time. She was not aware of all this stuff. And then of course, the first person she meets is Tyler D of all people. That's pretty traumatic <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> but, um, you know, so everybody in my family, mother, siblings, father, we all felt the electricity. My dad felt it so powerfully that I could see the muscles in his arm convulsing. Like if you clench your muscles, and he was rocking like this and his vision was blacking out. He couldn't see anything in the room. And he said, I'm going to pass out. So we got the metal out of his hand and Tyler looked at him and he said, why you? And he's like, what, you know, what does that mean? He said, I've only done this experiment with three people. And for you to feel this effect means that you have interfaced with an entity or, or, or the phenomenon face to face. And he'd only seen it three other times. And all six members of my family had this reaction. My dad almost passed out from it. Yeah. Talk about, he comes, he comes when he first comes, he's, he's, he produces ID. Can you describe that? And then talk about the connection to the lady where he realizes that this lady is an important connection and talk about the patch when he talks about the, the patch. Sure. Yeah. So when he came, he had, um, he had uh, four to five IDs 
in his, he was like renting a, a SUV or something. And he, 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 one by one, he pulled us to his vehicle. And he, I, I guess he did this because his protocol, like he had to tell us who he is, if he was really there on some form of uh, official investigation, but he took me and my brother, Jeremy, the middle boy, he took us to his SUV. He showed me and my brother, Jeremy, Area 51, NASA, Air Force Intelligence. They were, they were like, not, not badges like a cop has, but they were like uh, these laminates. They were, you flash them to people, but it's not like a badge in your wallet. You, you know what I mean, Bob? Um, and CIA as well? What, do you mention nope, CIA? No, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay. So he showed me Area 51, NASA, and Air Force Intelligence. And then he took Chris Jr. and my dad, my mom and my sister at different times. Then when he took my dad and my brother, Chris Jr., he showed them NRO, maybe not the NRO patch, but he did tell us that he was in the NRO. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Did he show you a picture badge with a blue or green border around the picture? Honestly, I mean, it's been seven, eight years. I can't remember that detail. I just remember that it was in this little slip and it had the writing clearly. I mean, it was an identification. I don't remember the color of the border. I I wish I did, but. The color um, of the border tells us whether or not he is a government employee or a contractor. Okay. Well, when he took my dad and Chris Jr., he showed them NASA, CIA, Area 51, Air Force Intelligence. And I don't know if he flashed an NRO thing, but he did disclose to us that he was a member of that. Um, If I'm going to be like technically honest here. So he did show the CIA, but only to my oldest brother and my dad, which I thought was weird. Okay. And what, what about the, uh, when he makes the reference to the fact that his boss had sent him there and this, this whole thing with the lady and the patch, which I think is pretty, again, it ties into this fact that this may not be as nuts and bolts as people think it is. Right. So he basically told us he was sent here to investigate the spiritual um, aspect of the phenomenon and that there's not a lot of truth out there on the internet. And he said it, don't believe what you read. I say it all the time. I get flack for it, but it's just what I was told by these invisible college people. Um, they are very aware on the inside and I'm not going to reveal what other people have told me in confidence, but I can just tell you all the high level people that I've spoken with. Um, they're, they're kind of a like mind that this is not a purely nuts and bolts phenomenon. Um, anyway, so back to, to Tyler. He said he's studying the lady, the divine aspect. He had the NRO patch. Um, It's this purple haired mystical lady. She looks like a Greek goddess. She has a trident in one hand and a fireball like a flame in the other. This is official NRO mission patch. And he, he didn't say what the nature of the mission was, but he just said, you know, we know she's real. That's why I know you're telling the truth. We're here to learn what she wants. And they made my dad put it in writing. He took it to the Pentagon. And then, Bob, you wonderfully explained this on the Project Unity interview about the implications of Camp David Napkin that was sent. No, that's I mean, the you photograph that, that Grant has way. shown. Grant I've has got shown it. everything. It's coming up. I've got it. We'll show it in a minute. Okay. Well, well, Bob knocks that out of the park because he he was in the intelligence community. He He understands the implications. He could explain it better than me. But, you know, if we want to get to that in a minute, back to the Tyler thing. So he made my dad write it in writing to the Pentagon. And he, I know you're looking for this, Grant. I know you're fishing for this. So I'll just go ahead and say it. He told us, (laughs) I know what you're fishing for. He said, um, my boss is this mysterious figure. Is this what you're looking for? No, I've never heard this. No, give it to me anyway. (laughs) That was interesting. (laughs) Well, when I said this, uh, some people, it was pretty funny watching Twitter. When I, when I said this, no one's ever said this publicly. Um, because they probably haven't heard it and, and people just, just lost it. They're like, oh my God, who's this figure? Well, if I knew I would have said it. But anyway, he said, my boss is this mysterious figure. Um, his name is the hammer and the hammer works for God. And that's all I can say. That's what, that's what he said. He said, that's all I can say. And we're like, well, who's the hammer? He's like, well, you know, I can't tell you. He's my boss. And um, so he basically told us that his boss, the hammer, this mysterious figure in whatever the invisible college is, works for God. And the hammer tasked him to come to our house because they said, Chris Bledsoe's the real deal. You need to learn about this phenomenon he's experiencing because it's not nuts and bolts. It's spiritual. They're like, we don't care about that nuts and bolts crap. It's not, you know, these, okay. I don't, I gotta be careful here. Tyler indicated to us in private, in the, in the confidence of our home that these 
crashes are gifts right from this on. phenomenon. They're right gifts. On. And he told yeah. us some other things about what they find on board of these gifted crashes. And I don't know if I should reveal what it is. Um, I, I know that these people are watching and listening to me. I, I know that for a fact. Um, so, so for the sake of my comfort, I'll just say that they have discovered some spiritual texts on board these um, crashes that were gifted to us. So let me go to a question now. And this is the big question that I always ask is, have they figured anything out? They may have bodies, they may have crafts, they may have metal that's gifted to them. I heard this as well, the gifted thing. Right. Uh, how much do you think they actually know? Like, in terms of what Tyler has told you or other people, just in general, you don't have to specify. Do you think they really know what's going on? Yes, I do. Um, I think if they were, I'm just going to put this um, plainly. If they were in league with these beings, why would they come to my house? You know, I think that they understand what's going on. They understand what the phenomenon is, but I do not think that the United States government is in contact with it. I think I'm just going to say my opinion. Yeah. This is my speculation. Yeah. Um, I think that they may be in contact with something else, but they know that there's this lady, this Marian apparition, there's these divine beings of light that really hold the keys to the universe and could just turn off their nukes if they want to. They could zap the, my dad saw a video in, in NASA mission control of a dummy warhead going into space, but they snuck real warheads on it. Tyler showed my dad this footage, this, this orb, this light, whatever flew around the rocket while it's going to space, sent controlled bursts at it and it tumbled into the ocean. And Tyler said, well, why didn't they let that go into space? It was a fake warhead. And dad said, no, it's not. You slipped real stuff in there. And Tyler said, well, you know, you're one of the most informed people I've ever met. He was always testing my dad, remote viewing things like that intuition. I think that they are not in league with these powerful beings. Um, if they were, they wouldn't need us. They wouldn't need our writings. They wouldn't need to investigate us. I could be wrong. Um, yeah. I do know for a fact, based on what I've been told, that these super elite groups, I'm not going to defame anybody. I'm not going to mention any names, but I just will say that these super elite, whoever you want to believe that they are, these invisible types, they hold an elite level of secret knowledge that they don't necessarily think that we are presently ready to receive. And therefore they're not incentivized to give it to us. Does that make sense? I'm trying to be very careful here not to defame yeah, anybody I, or, or put anybody down or up. To add a question to that, uh, I think we've got, here, here it is. Hal, so this Al Pobenmeyer yeah. comes to mm -hmm. your place. He talks to your dad about, I think your dad told me this, and I think you mentioned in an interview a little bit different frame. So you can frame it, that they wanted your dad to be like an, an ambassador, like the in-between right. NASA and the beings. Right. So Hal was coming to our property for, that's the new property that you said you've recently been to, correct? And the pond and everything. This is where Bob went. Grant has not been there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I misunderstood in the, in the pre-show. So he came around for 11 years, multiple times a year. He came birthdays, holidays, you know, Christmases, Thanksgiving, my sister's college graduation just showed up one day. He said, Hey, I drove 12 hours from Cape Canaveral. Is, is, is this the residence of Chris Bledsoe? And I'm, you know, 15 year old kid. I'm like, uh, let me call my dad. You know, he just showed up in our life and he never left until the day he died. And finally, after about the 10th year, he started letting loose why he was really coming to our property. And the, I guess the main thing was he was tasked to debunk us by NASA. And then he ended up reporting that we were genuine. He had three families, including ours. And NASA wanted him to determine which of these three families was going to be the face of this phenomenon if it ever gets disclosed to the public. So he formally asked us. And then of course, my dad said, yes. And then he died. So we, we, we never got to hear how that turned out. I mean, he, yeah. he was our main NASA guy, but um, yes, he, he, they were wanting to know if our family would be interested in being some sort of ambassador family for disclosure. And that, that didn't go anywhere after his death. Yeah, that makes so, sense. So let, me, so let me say, let, go ahead. Go ahead. Hal was on his way to visit them, leaving his house. He fell and hit his head 
yeah. and died. He was going to spend Thanksgiving. Now, with I'm him. not reading anything into that. It just seems awfully weird. Yeah, it was the day he was coming to our house for Thanksgiving. He fell and hit his head. We didn't hear from him. And I believe it was the next day his wife called us and said, how's not going to make it? He hit his head yesterday. That's why we couldn't come. And we were just shocked. We were, it was, it was sad. He did, he did write a book though. He, he wrote a book that talked about your family and the experiences, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, he did. And going back, one more question, going back to Tyler. Um, you haven't read American Cosmic, but there's a story told, Diane tells a story in there about Tyler sitting in a room and in the room beside it, there's some sort of, but maybe Bob, you remember the details of it. There's some sort of instrument or some sort of thing that helps them think better. Did he right. tell you that story? He did not. No. But he does tell the story of being in the room next to some object. And from this object, he got all sorts of information as a download into his head. And it's led to most, if not all of his developments, which have made him a very, very wealthy man. You can find him online if you figured out his name yeah. as others have, and you can figure out that he has a medical instrument company and he's made himself extremely wealthy. And yeah. these are downloads from whatever this is. He, he did tell me when I was at the cabin, he did tell me, cause he knew I was into downloads. And he did tell me the story of the one that he put on the space shuttle that they tried to block, that Diane talks about the general yelling who invented this. He told me the story, and I remember um, he told me, he said, Grant, the idea, that idea came into my head in the morning. He said, the last thing I remember the night before was a hooded figure standing at the end of the bed. And I said, could you see its face? He said, no, I couldn't see its face. I said, well, you should go to Von Smith. You go to L.A. all the time. You should go to Von Smith and get regressed. And I think that was one of the things that Jim Semivan because Jimmy Semivan had the beings in his room and yeah. Tyler and these guys are experiencers. And that's the whole thing is they're trying to figure out. That's why they came to your dad because they're trying to figure out what's going on as well. Is that correct? Would that be accurate? Yeah. Um, I had a phone call with Jim Semivan last week. Actually, we spoke almost an hour. Uh, there were some uh, people who were kind of messaging me, uh, intimidating me, trying to things of that nature. So I called Jim and, you know, he, he spoke to me as long as I was comfortable and assured me everything was all right. And we just, we just got to chatting and I brought up Tyler D and the only thing he could say about him, anytime we ever chat with him, he says, yeah, he's real. I've never met him, but he's real. And he changes the subject. So it, it's very funny. Like these people know of each other, but they don't interact. Um, anyway, so back to your question, I don't know if I should disclose the name of Jim's experience unless it's public um, Jim well Jim writes about it in one of the forwards to um, okay. Tom DeLong's book he just basically says I had an encounter and it basically destroyed my idea of what reality was all about something to that effect so we've never got into the details of who he and we just know that he had the interaction in the early 1990s and right. that he went to the CIA and wanted to know what the heck's going on and my story I heard was that he was briefed when he left when he became, when he went into the contract world, that's when they told him what was going on. But they told him, leave it alone. Pretend it's a one-off. Pretend yeah. it'll never happen again. This will ruin your career. I heard that's what he was told. Right. Well, what he told me in person, um, I'm not going to go into the details of the beings he saw because I, I just feel yeah. like if, if he has Yeah, said, that's always confidential. I know that's confidential. Right, right. But what, he was he was a low level. This was uh, 20, 25 years ago. He was new in the CIA. He was a lower level individual at the time as you know, by the time he retired, he was like a GS 19. I mean, that's like incredibly high, but um, he had this experience with him and his wife, who's a, a wonderful person. And it freaked him out. Uh, they had some lasting effects from it. And basically he went to his superiors and while he was, he was in the CIA at this time. He went yep. to his superiors and he said, this happened to me. I need to know like, what, what is this? And they were like, Jim, leave it alone your career is going to be ruined. If you're read into this program, you're going to be the laughing stock. People are going to mock you. They're going to haze you. Your career will be over. And Jim was like, I don't care. I have to know what happened to me and my wife, you know? So just, let's just note that for a second, even in the CIA at this level, you're mocked, you're shunned. This is how compartmentalized the UFO subject is. It's only need to know. This is what Jim told me from his own mouth to me. 
personally. It is only need to know. And Jim had a need to know because he experienced it and he was a, you know, employee of the CIA or whatever. So he opted to read in. We all know what happened to him. He became one of the directors of clandestine services. So I think he was led to get to that position by this phenomenon. Bob, you talked, you, you mentioned the, the backlash inside the CIA. There's a group in there that believes this is demonic and they're out to get people who... I think people outside know them as the, the Collins elite and they're not all in the CIA. Yeah. So uh, they're, they're deeply religious. They seem to be associated with Battelle Corporation, which is not far away from Ryan Patterson. And they seem to have deeply held religious beliefs that the entire phenomenon is demonic. Now, your dad is, is, is actually giving a tour. You talked about this a couple of times. I think this is the gangway where they put the people on the, uh, on the, the, the Neil rocket. Neil Armstrong and all yeah. the other Apollo 11 astronauts and every other astronaut, including the ones that just went up on the SpaceX Dragon, walk out that door to go to be trans, transported to the launch pad. Every right. astronaut. Yes. Yeah. And then here's the one. We'll just quickly flip over because we don't want to. No, no, let me point out one more thing. Not just everybody gets to walk down that gangplank. Yeah. It is not a tourist area. Mm -mm. Yeah. Tyler D. told my father when he took him there, this was him who, who obviously took him there. He said about 300 people ever have been inside that room. This room? This I, don't know room. If, I don't know if that's the room, but it's the one where that door, I wasn't there, you know. This is the, con this the, is the, astronauts, this is the con astronauts conference room yeah. and... I can't believe they're in there. And he said only one president has ever had the privilege of being in this specific facility. Which indicates your father was taken very seriously inside. I remember him telling me when Tyler was taking him around, he said he had the keys to the place. He would just <laughs> wave and people would open gates and he was just, they're yeah. going around on one of these rover things. And he said there was just people like saluting him. He was like, he said, he's got the keys to the place. That's the way he described yeah, he's, it. He's, <laughs> the he's the dragon. He's the dragon. This is, this is the other one. Here's Jim, which again, I want to show this photograph to show that this is not hypothetical that Jim <laughs> Semivan was around. He was coming to your father's birthday party. Yeah. He was very close to you. Uh, who is it that actually, get, I, you, I think your father told me there was a, somebody who actually got the kids and the family together. Cause I think some of the kids were getting a little frustrated with the backlash they were getting and said, you, I want you to know that your father is respected. And there's some of the people on the highest levels of government know who your father is and you should respect your father and something like that. Did that actually happen? Yeah, that was Jim. That was this weekend. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a photo. Uh, if you don't have his photo, Grant, I, I can send it. a Chris can see this photo. I took this photo. Where Jim and all the kids are together and Jim is telling them that story. Yeah. Oh, just context for this photo. We were at some local pizza joint and this young girl had the alien shirt on and we were talking about this stuff and we're like, oh my God we're talking about aliens. You want to take a photo with like, we do not know this person or her boyfriend. It was just hilarious that she walked in with the alien shirt. But um, yeah, um, that really did happen. Grant, he came over for my dad's birthday and he said, you know, invite anybody you want to meet me. Anybody, it doesn't matter. Friends, family, I don't care. He let me invite over about 10 friends. Um, and we had a large group around a bonfire and he told everybody plainly, he said, you know, we introduced him as who he was or whatever. And he told them all, he said, this man right here is the most credible and studied UFO experiencer who has ever lived. And we are, well, he didn't say we, he said people and facilities around the world are daily talking about this man and what happened to him. Places you've known. So at, the, at, the, at the meeting, Jim and his wife are, are about to leave or, or it's in the evening and they go out and they stand by the tree and the photo yeah. is taken of them. Right. So no one had ever looked at this photo in any great detail. So I got the photo and I did some enhancement on the photo in uh, Photoshop. And Jim and his wife were surrounded by orbs at that tree. <laughs> they had, had no idea. And I told Jim and he said, wow, at least they didn't follow me home. <laughs> Yeah. Can it's you talk though. a little bit about these guys? Because a lot of people think like these spooks, you know, they've got guns and they're like evil guys. And you've run up against a lot of these guys. They're just ordinary people who are doing a job or they're very interested, correct? Correct. Yeah. 
Because Jim, you said, is a very funny guy. He's always playing games with you when you ask yeah. him questions. He's hilarious. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice guy. And uh, his wife is just a wonderful person. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's really fun to have at like parties and gatherings. He just, he gets the whole, his energy is, is electric. Um, he just so happens to have basically run the spy program for the United States, but <laughs> he's, he's a very cool individual. Now here, here's one, the Tom DeLong, uh, Lou Elizondo thing. Yeah. When, when did you first meet these guys? So I have only met Jim. I have not met Lou or Tom, but dad met them through Jim. Um, well, the context on that is we were knowing about to the stars before it was to the stars. Like we had been friends with Jim for a year well or whatever. Before. Well before. Yeah. We already knew it was in the works. I mean, he kept telling us. Um, and Lou got, had not separated yet. Right. Well, I, I don't know that detail, but um, I think we I saw know you when Lou separated. Right. And yeah. he had not separated yet. Right. I think I saw you tweet that this week, which is, which is why I'm aware of what you're talking about. But um, so Tom was the story on that is, Tom had made some friends with some generals because he was sincerely and genuinely interested in UFOs. I mean, in the nineties, he came out with a song called aliens exist with blink 182. He just, he loves the subject. Right. And as far as a civilian goes, he started really asking some questions because he had been sort of guided by these um, generals and it, it came to Jim's attention or some of his associates. And they basically met with Tom they questioned him to determine what his intentions were. And Tom just came clean, like, hey, I just want to help. I'm just interested in this subject. And they said, okay, great. And he became really good friends with Jim. And next thing you know, to the stars was born. But we were knowing about his chat. He would be on the phone with Tom at our house. Like that, that photo when we were at the pizza shop, when we walked outside, he was on the phone with Tom DeLong. And I'm like, tell him hi. <laughs> you know, like it, it was in the works for years or at least a year. I remember one of my talking favorite to photos well. is uh, one of my favorite photos is Chris and Tom DeLong and Jim and I forget which other famous oh, UFO researcher was sitting around the table at their house drinking coffee outside on that, a pleasant day. That was Bill Tompkins, and that was in a Starbucks. Bill Tompkins, yes. That was a, that was in a Starbucks in California. Yep, Bill William Tompkins. Wow. Um, anything you want to ask here? Um, we you're, do, you're doing great and Ryan is too I just kind of want to make comments here and there yeah thank you so much yeah okay because I I, I as well I, I pointed out that when to the stars I was talking to your dad as well in the 15 16 period right and I remember I'm asking him in July I've even seen the email I asked him is is Tom making the announcement this week and I put out managing magic eight months before uh, they ever went public. I identified who Jim Semivan was and the fact that they were going to drop this thing. And then eight months later, Tom DeLong goes on stage. So a lot of people sort of get the idea that it was sort of like happened in 2017, but your father was very much involved uh, long before there and knew what was going on. Right. I, um, never mind. Never mind. I'll bring that up <laughs> in a little bit. <laughs> now here's the one. You posted it. Your father sent it to me. Yeah. Uh, nobody, you didn't make any comment. He didn't make any comment. You were going to tell the story before. And I said, let's wait to this. And this is the idea about the briefing. So can you tell me this? Because I saw your dad showed me the envelope, but he showed me also a medal. I don't know if you were allowed to talk about that, but here's, here's the napkin that you're talking about. So tell the story about whether you're this idea of president Obama being told about your father or briefed about your father. Well, I think if you're comfortable Bob really knocks this out of the park. <laughs> okay, Bob. Okay, so look, the envelope is covered up by a folder with somebody stuck uh, Camp David napkin in it, and it has the official presidential seal with Camp David on it. Yeah. And the envelope, the, the writing on the envelope is Chris Bledsoe's address. Right. And in that envelope was Chris's uh, writings about what he had experienced. Mm -hmm. And Camp David napkin with the presidential seal on it is very official. It is a crime to duplicate it. And only one man can get you to Camp David. Now he doesn't necessarily have to be there, but he has to, you have to get an official okay from him to go there. 
And so uh, somebody okayed by Obama went to Camp David and was briefed is the implication of this photo. Okay. And that photo was taken by Tyler and sent to Chris. Okay. And that's pretty powerful evidence. I mean, that shows powerful, just uh, pow this is just powerful evidence. And hey, boy, does that table look familiar. <laughs> How's our kitchen table? I, I just got a, a, a note in the chat, and um, this is relevant. He, he was called the Dragon as a code name, and oftentimes, like when he took my dad to NASA, he had a shirt with a dragon on it. It was just his code name. Uh, we don't know what it means. Um, I just got this in the chat saying that people wanted to hear about the Dragon. It, it, people have these tags when they have these positions, and it's just what he was known as in NASA was the Dragon. Um, and if you don't mind me answering this next question in the chat. Yep. I, I do not believe in reptilians. I do not. I don't believe in them. Sorry. <laughs> well, you yeah. haven't experienced them. I haven't lots experienced them and I don't believe lots them. Lots and lots of people claim to have experienced them. Yeah, they do. But, you know, a lot of people don't believe our claims, you know. It, the, yeah. Well, in that terms, like there's this idea, this thing that they're not really that physical, that they appear as whatever you right. want. Correct me if I'm wrong. When I talked to um, your brother, he was indicating grays, whereas your father was not seeing grays. He was seeing a different. And the grays, I always, uh, John Mack used to bring this up, that that perhaps the alien you see is in, uh, based upon your state of mind that people who are very fearful will see grace. And you're, I remember your brother telling me how traumatizing this whole thing was. It would, so do you, did he tell you what kind of beings he was seeing in the room that were coming to him? In yeah. I'll tell you where he got grace from because after 2007, we started watching UFO shows because we wanted to know what happened. And he kept seeing the grays, the grays, the grays. When it first happened, he never called them the grays. He drew them and described them identically to my father. Um, they were these little tiny beings that glowed like the pale moon. They looked like they wore glass. They were almost yeah. like an apparition. Yeah. They described them identically. He, okay, he, but when they were coming in later on, they were coming. He said they were coming back. Was it the the the, the glass ones? It's it the same beings with the red okay. eyes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, um, I, there was. I'm so sorry, but there was a question earlier in the chat. I just didn't want to interrupt. And no. I keep seeing this asked over and over and over. And I realize we just never tell this part of the story. Um, it says, what's the furry thing that the alien handed Chris? He said he left it in the dog kennel overnight and never finished the story. Um, it's funny. He usually doesn't finish that story. But what that was, um, the lady told him that it was um, a, a very powerful metaphor to understand. It, it was like a spiritual, I don't, I don't know how to put this into words, but it was not something that he could keep. It may not have been really there. It was a metaphor for his struggle with telling the story. It was like this living creature that bit him and pricked him. It, it harmed him, but it was his burden to carry it and basically tell the world. It was, it was a powerful metaphor for his story. Um, it's not a, it's not a tribble. It's not a Star Trek being it's, it's these beings are, they give you messages in, in very strange ways that sometimes you see something and then it's gone. You know, does that make sense, Grant? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember he's told that story numerous times, and he had to protect it. They told him, you yeah. can't put it down, you've got to protect it. And uh, he, that's when the lady appeared, when he put it in the dog kennel. And, right, right. Yeah, it was a metaphor make, for his burden to tell his story, because yeah. for five or more years, he would never talk. Yeah. And that was, that was hurting him on the inside, because he felt compelled to tell it, but he was afraid. But then when he tells it, it hurts him. It bites him, it pricks him because you get all these people pushing back or, you know, whatever. Do I believe we're living in the end times? You, 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 look, you could just tell Chris was traumatized by mm -hmm. all the years of negativity that he had to endure from family and friends. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite stories that kind of is extremely descriptive of Chris's struggle is he would come out the door in the morning and there would be members of his church there praying for him every, every morning when he walked out the door. I mean, oh, yeah. it's just a, it's just a hell of a struggle Chris has gone through. Yeah, I love my mother. I love my mother to death. But um, and, and, and I, I want to say this. I understand and am able to, as an adult, reconcile with the fact that my mother at first could not accept this. 
And well, she a, was traumatized. That's okay. Right. It's okay. She, that she was traumatized. That. They right. were all traumatized. Every we, one of them. We were all traumatized. Um, yeah. You, you, I think you mentioned, your dad mentioned to me that he had what, 400 people working for him or whatever. And he said, once this became public, basically that nobody would talk to him anymore. I mean, you were in a very sure. difficult position where sure. it was Pentecostals, Southern Baptists, all this kind of stuff, where people, even the contractors, didn't want anything to do with it as well, that they had the yeah. experience. But it's a very difficult place to bring up a story like this, correct? It's still difficult. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to be rude, gentlemen, but we're getting um, messages in the chat. Should I address these, Grant? I mean, it's yeah, your, sure, it's your if you will. I just whatever. got two. Let's just do these two, and then you can address whatever questions you want. I just well, want talk, to go talk about the medal, and then there's a question about the medal. Okay, so this is the medal. Your dad, it was, he was dripping on the driveway right. from an orb, and they collect this stuff, and they put it together. And so that's the one that your dad, there was a lot of pieces of metal floating around. This is the one, and I can tell you this story, that Tyler D. was actually taken to this site by a friend of mine by the name of Mark Olson. And that's where I got those photographs from. Mark was there. They were at a conference in, in Arizona. And he said to Tyler, we're going on this dig. You want to come to this dig? And Tyler said, yeah, I'll go along. And so they went around and he said, as soon as Tyler saw the metal, Tyler got excited. Like he, yeah. he, he figured this was surreal. And so that's when he blindfolds these people and takes them back. He takes them back to what he, they call the gifting site, which I think is important. But this one piece of metal, Mark gave me the photograph of it. And here it has, again, the triangle on this piece of, of metal. And I always say the thing with the metal, it always makes sense that it's a gifting thing. I even right. asked Hal Putoff. I said, Hal, come on, Hal. I mean, you, you, this has got to be like a port stuff. They're dropping this stuff for <laughs> on, on purpose. It, it doesn't make any sense. You're going to fly a, a flying saucer across the galaxy and then little, piece, little pieces falling off. You can mm -hmm. take it with a sledgehammer. You can't break it with a sledgehammer. But when it hits the ground, it, it shatters like a, like a uh, glass drop from the fifth floor of a balcony. It's, it just doesn't make any sense. But when you hear the gifting thing, then you realize, like, maybe this is what it is. And so this is one of the pieces from that field that has, the again, the triangle in it. And you'd seen this photo, right? That's the Philosopher's Stone. Look at it. That's the Philosopher's Stone. That's a metaphysical symbol that okay. these beings are gifting to us. Yeah. Yeah, I have seen this. Um, I saw it through you posting it on Facebook, but I had heard of it because my father was shown this photo by Tyler D himself. And then I had never seen it until you uh, posted it. Um, I so Grant, you kind of glossed over very quickly that Tyler D and American Cosmic takes uh, Diana and the other person who is unnamed, but all of us know uh, to the gifting field. And not many people know your connection to Tyler D going to the gifting field and you glossed over it quickly. <laughs> okay. So, so my friend, I've got a big business friend here in, in Winnipeg who goes to the big UFO conference in Phoenix, which uh, Tyler showed up one year. And my friend Mark doesn't go to lectures. He just goes out in the, on, onto the balcony and he says to people, so why are you here? And he just talks to people about their story. So he met Tyler D there and they hit it off and they hung out during the conference. And there was a dig taking place. And the guy's name that was doing the dig escaped me. But they went out there for a couple of days. And that's when he said to Tyler, do you want to come to this dig? We're going to go on this UFO dig. And um, so Mark Olson took Tyler out there. And he said, as soon as Tyler saw this material, he was, he was, he knew this is the real deal. He was all, got all excited. And uh, Mark didn't know anything about anything. And so when I, when I heard that Tyler had taken these people out to the field, I said, oh, it's got to be the same place that, and I went, and sure enough, it was the it's the same spot where uh, Mark Olson had taken him a couple of years before. I didn't know that till the other day <laughs> when I asked yeah. you. Yeah. So you got the questions. I, I want to um, maybe get your opinion on. You've done a you you're sort of the spokesman for the family, and you've done an outstanding job. You've you've given stories that I hadn't heard before, and can you give me sort of my last question would be. Uh, what's what's the status on the story going in Hollywood or what's going on there? Because I know you guys have been struggling uphill for a long time. And it is a story that may have been a five year series, stuff like this. Big companies were looking at it. And when you hear the stories that are told tonight, you realize why people would jump on this story, because this is uh, one of the, it is the most incredible story I think there is in, in the UFO field in terms of evidence and high level officials. And so what, what's the status of all that? I appreciate that, Grant. Um, that's really kind of you. And, and the status of that is 
uh, over a year and a half ago, we signed another option agreement, which stated that we had to remain silent for at least a year. It was about 18 months. And, and the purpose of that, we didn't collect any money. We've actually spent money on lawyers. We've lost many thousands of dollars retaining these lawyers. We've never gained a dime from it. People are always saying we're getting rich, haven't been paid. Uh, that, that makes me, that, I resent that. You know, Bob, you've been to our house. Anyway, um, the status of that is that we are out of the option agreement phase where we can't um, publicly talk about things. And now they encourage us to talk, but we are still in a mutual agreement that they are willing to pitch the show. They're still making their rounds. COVID has slowed things down. But um, we really like, we really love the guys who wrote The Conjuring and our story is in their hands for the time being. We are past option agreement, but we, we want them to tell the story because they're phenomenal story st- uh, storytellers. But w- we don't know what's going to happen to it. It's not finite. It's, it's not on paper. It's all pitch, pitch, pitch. Hope somebody takes it. We don't know. It's not Warner Brothers anymore, by the way. That was about seven years ago, Grant. <laughs> yeah. I remember w- when we were at the, the, um, um, that cabin. So um, we were there and Mark Olson was there. Mark Olson is a very wealthy guy um yeah. mark mark leon was there he's a wealthy guy and i remember chris was talking about the the contract and i think it had gone through two lawyers already and they were going oh, yeah. the third round and your dad kept turning it down because they wouldn't give him a control of the end of the movie and he said and maybe you can get into the message from the from the lady that he said no it's the message i that's the thing the money really doesn't matter and i heard the yeah. figure of what he was offered and i remember these guys saying to him no, no, don't take royalties. It's 20 bucks for a pencil. They're not, they're not going to pay you anything royalties. Take the money up front. And they were advising him. But Chris's main thing was the story. It wasn't that I'm going to sign this off. He could have taken, I heard the money. It was a huge amount of money that he could have walked away with. But he would have had to allow Hollywood to tell the end of the story. And he didn't want him to turn it into an evil alien more yeah. thing because the, the, he had been given a message. So what, can you sum up what the message is that the lady is telling Chris wants out in this, in this, uh, this, uh, whatever it is, whether it's a documentary or a TV series or movie or whatever, what, what, what is, is the ultimate aim of what this, the message is? The ultimate aim is that there is a God. You don't got to put a name to it, but there is a God. There's a real force. There's a real being from which all other beings come from. We have a purpose for being here and there was a purpose for our creation and the ultimate finale of this experience or what have you is the lady told my father there would be a great deception that even the very elect would be deceived when the time comes and i think we can all see the way this disclosure is going i mean anybody that reasonably studies this stuff for five minutes can see that it's all about these scary sci-fi monsters from other planets who come and they probe us and they mutilate our cows and all this and all that the lady said all that's a lie i'm not defaming anybody i'm just saying conceptually here um the lady said all that's a lie and that the world will be deceived that there is no god there is no spirit nothing don't believe the deception and i say it i hammer it home on 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 the internet all the time they're spiritual they're magical they're divine whatever that is just know that there's something out there you're meaningful you're special we're all special but the deception is that we're not special we're meaningless there is no god you have no soul that's in a nutshell what the lady said we need to look out for that message. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. Beautiful. I believe the lady part. I don't believe yeah, the lie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it was true. I remember I was sort of doubting your father at one point. We were driving to New Jersey airport and I was sort of doubting something. And I remember we were sitting in the back seat and he leaned over to me and said, I was there with her. You weren't. And I went, oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's, it's kind of true. I mean, he... He was there and I wasn't. I just know what he tells me. Um, There's a question here that's talked about Tyler. I remember in the American Cosmic talks how he interacts with the beings, where he talks this protocol where he sleeps for eight hours, then he gets up for one hour, then he, he doesn't never touches alcohol, then he takes a big glass of water and he goes and sits on the balcony in the sun and he drinks the water, and that's when he gets this contact with the beings. I think he's got 40 patents or whatever. But there's a question here, and uh, you may have brought up another interview about him getting answers from a glass object. Do you remember that? Well, that was actually just a dream I had. I tweeted it the other day. <laughs> it was just a dream. So it was your dream. It wasn't Tyler's yeah. dream. Yeah, I, just, I had a dream that I was walking in, in Florida with Tyler, 
And um, he had this glass object. And when he looked in it, it was like he could swipe it and analyze the, it's just a dream. You know, okay. I just, I thought it was an interesting dream. Okay. That and Tyler tells everybody that ever wants to have any inter interaction with whatever he's interacting with, not to drink coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and yet your dad, when when your dad, I always make the joke, you'll see on the internet all the time, uh, I always, as soon as I go to your dad, we head to McDonald's for coffee. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my, my dad drinks coffee at 10 p.m. And he sees, <laughs> I remember he sees it was 48 thing. cents, I couldn't believe it, 48 cents for a cup of coffee, I go, oh yeah. my God. Well, that's a senior coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was, that's, that was our, where we hung out, and then he'd bring coffee back for your mother and stuff. Yeah. But uh, is there any other questions you see in the chat that you want yeah, to answer? There's them? about five or six if you guys okay. have time. And, and, and I'm Beautiful. just here. Like I'd... Oh, yeah. I mean, you're, you're this, I mean you're, you've got stuff that uh, probably people have never heard before. Even I, a lot of the stuff you brought up in the three interviews you did, I was shocked. The one with the cow, I'd never heard that story. And I collect your, your family stories. I wrote about your father in, in a book in 2015. I've been fascinated with this story for a long time. So anything you want to add, go right ahead. Sure. Yeah. And um, we, and I just want to say on, on behalf of me and my father, we really respect you. Um, good friend. I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Grant, for anybody that doesn't know, was the first one who ever asked me to do an interview. It was a year ago. And I said, sounds great, Grant. Let me talk to my dad. But we were in the Hollywood option agreement. Yeah, yeah. So my friend, Joel Griffin Dodd, who Bob referenced about three weeks ago, he said, Hey, do you want to do an interview? And I was like, uh, I don't know. Let me think about it. And then I said, sure, you know what, for you, I'll do it. And then I did another one through another friend. And then I said, I'm going to get up with Grant because he asked me first. Well, that and that and Dave, Dave Scott did that interview and like with, usual, that Dave was on behalf of Joel. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that was Joel's. He was set Joel, that up. Joel had yeah. Dave Scott do the interview. Right, right, right. And Dave Scott was amazing. And then next thing you know, dad's texting me, Jimmy church's number. He's like, go on there. I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Cool. But I just wanted to say to the world that Grant was the first to ask and i'm very delighted to be here i very much respect grant's work and everything so to the questions um uh the metal the metal that we held where was it what was it where did it come from well it came from tyler d it was and it the was, gifting field it oh, came from the gifting field right but at the time we had not heard of that that came out in american cosmic but i i believe that's correct um he didn't tell us exactly where it came from what he told us at our house in 2013 was that somewhere out was it new mexico yeah new mexico yeah. he just said it was somewhere out in new mexico they find this stuff he brought it to us and when you held one piece you didn't feel anything but when you held two pieces if this was the stipulation that tyler said if you had ever interfaced with an entity or a deity or whatever this weird spiritual phenomenon is you feel the energy and we did all six members of my family did um so that that's that's the whole thing about the metal i mean it, it, it okay i haven't said this yet we were shown a chart about the metal with isotopes that do not presently exist on earth. Now, my theory, my speculation, maybe that's what Bob Lazar's talk about. I don't, I don't know. I don't read much about that, but I do know that when Tyler was at our house, he was telling us about a guy named Bob Lazar. I don't know if he's true or false. Tyler okay. never said, okay. I don't well, know. There is the stuff that Jacques Ballet uh, points out that the, the isotopes are bad, but to me, that's where I still went to, to help put off. And I said, I mean, it's, it's, even if the isotopes are all bad, it's still like the gifting field. It's like, yeah. there's always metal found at these sites. Why are they dropping this metal? And it's always weird metal. And it's like the UFO thing. It's, it's not to give you really an answer on how to build a flying saucer. It's to make you go like, wow, this is, this is not from earth. This and it, crazy. Yeah. it's like, a, it's like, a, it's like this game thing that you talked about at the beginning where they're giving you these clues, these hints. And to me, it just doesn't make any sense that they keep dropping this metal. We even got one at the University of Arizona, Desta and I, and from 1939, 99% nickel with a, a copper core in the middle of it. And it came flying out of the sky and landed in this, dug in this guy's yard and it was so hot he couldn't move it out. This stuff is dropped all the time. And to me, it's like the, the theory of, wow, they just want you to go like, wow, what's going on here? Like, it's just so weird. Yeah. And uh, that's and it's to me, it's gifted. Whereas and what so Hal Putoff said to me, he didn't deny that this may be a port material. He just said, yeah. we're going to analyze the material one step at a time. And I maintain that, that even if you say there's weird isotopes, it, it just takes you one step to say this isn't from here. But right. it really, in some ways, doesn't give you any answers to what's actually going on. you got to talk to the experiencers to know what's going on. Yeah. And I do want to say that I, I think your theory of wow is one of the best things I've ever read in my life truly i'm not just like sucking up yeah. that is a wonderfully thought out theory and it's true and i've experienced it since i was a child 
that these beings show up and they say, what can I do to make this guy say, wow, that was weird. <laughs> Start mooing like cows. Seriously, Grant, that's, that's one of the best things I've ever read. Yeah, that's why I liked Thank your you. cow story. Cause that happened to me the <laughs> second night I saw the UFO. The yeah. first night I, I was just, I fell off the edge of the earth. I couldn't believe it was for real. Flew right in front of the car. But the second night when it came at me, I was all excited again, but then it made a turn and just flew off. And I'm thinking, what's it doing? It's not doing anything. Yeah. It's just flying, flying along. Yeah. It didn't make any sense. And it always stuck with me. Like, what are they actually doing? Cause they didn't, you'll see UFO sightings. They'll appear for 10 seconds, five seconds. They show, they dance. Like, why do they do zigzags in the sky? Because yeah. they know people are watching. It's, it's, it's yeah. It's like, why are they messing with me? Now that would beg the question in my brain, why would aliens who are probably nihilistic don't care about you? They come from another planet. Why would they go through all that trouble to mess with you? Well, I believe that it's about belief. It's about a greater purpose. It's about guiding us. And those people who have those wow moments, they're ready for those moments. You know, they, they usually are. Um, but yes, it's, it's all about making you think twice about things. Do I accept this? Do I not accept this? This is weird. I can't get it out of my head. You know, it would destroy our psyche if they just walked in our room to everybody on the planet. It, it, it would wreck people. I mean, my brother was 17. It wrecked him. You've met him. I can absolutely confirm that when I talked to your brother and I, that was 2013. So that was like six years later. He was still totally traumatized by what had oh, happened. Yeah. He was yeah. really traumatized. True terror and trauma. But I, 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 Ryan hasn't said, but I will say, he is in really good shape now. Yeah, he's yeah, for sure. Business. He has his. He has a kid. He's doing really well. And of course, the, the apple of uh, Chris and Yvonne's uh, eye is Chris Jr.'s son. <laughs> yeah, he's doing. He's doing great now. I'm not. He's I'm doing not trying really to say really well. Did, did, was it saying, was it true that Tyler D helped Chris Jr. out? He talked about well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they definitely talked. I, I, I wasn't in the room. I don't yeah, know. I, I just got the impression that, that Tyler had helped get him to come to grips with what was going on and, he did. and that kind of stuff where yeah. it's different if you hear it from me, but you hear it from this guy from NASA, then I had heard that he helped to turn Chris around in terms of the terror and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was about five years before my brother would really talk about it with me. I was 18 years old at the time. It was the same year with the cows and everything. Yeah. And he, he just wouldn't talk about it. And then that was about 2012. He started coming around. Now he'll talk about it, but um, it, it's not so traumatic to him anymore. Like he's, I feel like he's awakening into what it is and he's not running from it anymore. Let me, he, let me answer one of these questions. So or, it was said to Ryan, but I, but I just saw it and I know the, know the answer. Sure. Or is Chris concerned that Hollywood will muddy up your father's story? As Grant and Ryan told earlier, Chris has held out forever, yeah. even with huge amounts of money thrown at him. And yeah. he said, no, no, I don't care about your huge amount of money. I, what I care about is the message. Yeah. He hasn't taken the money and sold his soul. And what he wants in the end is to control the end of the story. Yeah. And he can't, he wants to control the story and not make money. Cause listen, I can tell you, Chris and Yvonne and the entire family have not made money out of this. Right. It has cost them a lot. Yeah. And I, and I like what you said, Bob, my father will never sell his soul. For, no, if that was the no. case, we've had dozens of book offers. We've had dozens of different series and different movies, but we really like these guys who did the conjuring. We trust them. And it is actually part of our option agreement slash contract, whatever you want to call it, that dad actually remains executive consultant position to where he can say, no, this is what happened. This is what needs to be there. That's what's so unique about our deal is he wants it to be hundred percent truthful or no deal at all. He, yeah. he has walked away from deals that said, no, 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 we need to change this. He said, no, you're not. I'm not letting you do it. And he walks away. He will never sell his soul. He, he told me the story of what Tom Dong had offered in terms of production money. And it was <laughs> staggering. And he the said, to me, he said now that. there's a decision I had to make. I could not believe it. He just turned it, turned it down. No. Well, the world doesn't know about that story, Grant. Yeah. No, no, you just revealed it, Grant, that Tom DeLong <laughs> tried to put Chris on contract. Well, now the world knows. <laughs> well, well, but I think everybody knows. I mean, Tom, Tom was there and there was that incident where Tom sort of said that he was a religious sort of fanatic or whatever on a coast to coast show. And and that's when I, I, I was always hesitant of Tom's things that the Grays meant, the aliens meant not to have souls and stuff like that. So I was always hesitant whenever Chris brought up Tom DeLong, uh, but yeah, so the, he did, and, and it was the same thing in that in that um, 
that cottage where he, this is the third go round that he had paid a lawyer twice and it had fallen apart. And this is the third time. And these yeah. guys were talking money and Chris could not have cared less. He said, no, he wanted. And so that was the question they asked here is, do you think that, that you've got control of it where they're not going to mess it up like uh, fire in the sky? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the goal is, is, is this part of the option agreement that my dad remains in the position of an executive consultant? Yeah. And just so, just so you, just let me amplify on that question. Travis and Chris are in regular contact yeah. and have become good friends. Travis so is they, a good they, soul, and and he does not want to have happen to him what has happened to Travis. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, that's that's for sure. And and back to what you had said, Grant. Well, now that the cat's kind of out of the bag, um, very respectfully here. With respect to Tom, who is a great friend of my father's, I look forward to meeting him someday. I made, when I talked to Jim on the phone last week, I said, Jim, this is going to sound crazy, but you got to promise to introduce me to Tom. He's like, yeah, that's no big deal. Make it happen. Probably will never happen. I don't know, but he said it. And um, so the point I bring that up is we love Tom. He's a friend of our family and that's the full capacity of our relationship, right? So years ago, um, when TTSA was formed, Tom wanted to fully fund a movie about my father. But when you sign that dotted line, as always, there's no room for you to have control over your story. So dad walked away. That's, that's what Grant was referring to. The, the world, I don't know if the world knows the story, but that was an offer and we refused. Yeah, I think your dad's turned down a lot of stuff. You, you were mentioning. He has dozens of, he thinks I'm supposed to write the book. He's been telling me for 10 years. I'm like, dad, I can't write. I sucked at writing papers in college. I mean, I, I don't know the first thing about writing a book, but he's been telling me for 10 years, son, you're going to write the book. You're going to write the book. I'm like, okay, dad. Now I'm calling him like, dad, I think I'm going to write the book. <laughs> well, you're good. You know the stories. I, I, Cause your, your, your siblings don't really, they support it, but they're really not into it. You're the guy yeah. that was really into it, right? Right. They don't live in it day in and yep. day out. They love it. They like it. They support it. They don't talk about it all the time. It, yeah. it, it was, I think in a sense, it was more traumatic for them than it was for me because I was the one who was obsessed with finding out the truth of what my father experienced. Whereas they were dealing with more of the harassment and the ridicule and the shame of being a child or just trying to live a normal life. And now they were having there. experiences. Oh yeah. And while having oh. scary experiences. Yeah. And Tyler D. Stone test proves they are all having experiences. If what he claims is true is anyone who feels the electric shock has been in the presence. Yeah. There's a, there's a thing in the chat thing here about the beer cans and somebody gets the idea they were collecting beer cans. They weren't, they were looking at is correct me if I'm wrong. These small beings with the red eyes were looking at beer cans and stuff in the fire pit. They were just picking it up and looking at yeah, it. Yeah, they were just finding trash, Mountain Dew bottles, yeah. beer bottles, and they were like looking at it, like picking yeah. it up. And my yeah. brother so they weren't collecting beer cans. No, they weren't collecting. No, no. Someone said here there's like an effigy to Bigfoot or something with beer cans. Yeah, Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love Bigfoot. Uh, Big, <laughs> Bigfoot's awesome. So I got a few questions here. If you guys still have the time. Sure. Uh, the spiritual text. I regret to say I specifically said I will not reveal what that text is. Um, because it was told to be in confidence, but let's just say that there was a gifted crashed vehicle with a well-known text on board, and it was simply to mess with the, the government people. Um, it's, it's one that is very well known. Um, anyway, so okay. does Ryan agree with his dad about this being angelic? Yes, <laughs> 100%. I do not think it's about aliens. I am not saying aliens are not real. I'm not saying they can't be real. What I'm saying is we are being lied to and we are being deceived that there are only aliens and there's no God or there's no spirit. I think they can coexist. I haven't seen an alien. That's all I'm saying. I'm not putting down anybody that says they've seen this or they've seen that. But um, do I believe we are living in the end times? I think that's a slippery slope. I don't think the times will end. I think that we are living in times that can be called biblical because like the lady told my father, there are powerful people like 1% of the world type powerful people who are making events happen on the world showcase in order to force about an end time event. I do not believe time will end. I do not believe the world will end. I think that is fear and hysteria that is indoctrinated into our mind. Um, but yes, I believe we are in apocalyptic times where things will be revealed. Um, 
Can I elaborate what the beings of light look like? They look like uh, humanoid forms. They're eight to nine feet tall and they are just glowing, shimmering light. Like that Nicolas Cage movie, The Knowing or whatever. They like appear like literally light. That's what they look like to my father when they took off their hood. Uh, they were just light, light beings. Yeah. Mojave incident. Jim Simi Van told us to look into that one. He said it was similar to our story. Uh, back in like the 70s or 80s, there was this dude named Charles Hess who was in the desert. He was in a camper with his wife or something. I never looked into it, but Jim said that that story, the Mojave incident and Dorothy Isaac were related to our family. That's what Jim told me. I watched the one, the one. The one thing Jim wants Chris and I to do is to take uh, equipment and other things and go out to the desert and set up in camp and see what lands. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jim, Jim indicated to me that um, every time my dad sends him an orb photo, he's like, dang, Tom, look at this one. Like, they're still reviewing our material, you know? When we send these things to people, they're still reviewing it. They're still very um, interested. And I think if Jim says it, maybe we should do it. The one thing he did tell me, though, is um, just like at Skinwalker Ranch, he's concerned that the cameras will be messed with. You know, he, he told me that on the phone this week. He's like, I don't know if it's going to let you film it. But, you know, I think if we set our intentions. Remember that the, 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 the message Chris claims he got was that they were going to help and not harm. Right. So if they're going to help, they're not going to destroy your cameras like they did in the beginning with Chris yeah. for years. True. They've Good stopped point. destroying his camera. Now they, now he takes videos. Yeah. And, and with you present in the videos. Yes. Uh, let's see. I missed a couple here. Am I concerned they'll muddy the story? No, we already went over that. Everyone loves you in the chat and are thanking you for being here. Well, thank you. Have you experienced the lady? No. I've said that in a previous interview. Oh, here's the good question. Wait, who said that? Somebody I know said this. Uh-oh. Somebody I know is watching this. I've never said that publicly. That's what happens when you're the spokesman. You get the hard questions. Right? Oh, okay. Like president's press secretary. I just... <laughs> He's trying to ambush you. <laughs> All right. Can everybody see this chat? Yes. It's UFO to know, Ryan. Well, are you going to answer that question? Or yeah, I, I, I guess. I guess. Yeah, no, no, no. Let's 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 go into it. Um, it says Ryan, you mentioned once that your dad remote viewed souls being put into Bigfoot beings. Can you elaborate? Uh, you guys familiar with that one? No, well, I'm familiar. I, it reminds me. You got to tell the story about the Pope and the remote viewing. Yeah. Well, all right. So my dad was with uh, Tyler. They were traveling the country um, and they were somewhere like at a hotel and they were sleeping in their separate rooms that night. They, they would go to Ohio a lot because there was some research or like there were some metals out there or something that Tyler would routinely take my dad out to Ohio. Ohio. Which, oh, Ohio. <laughs> what's the significance of that? Because I. Wright Patterson Air Force Base and the Battelle Corporation. I oh, see. I don't, I don't know that you're probably on something there, but he would fly my dad out to Ohio a lot. And that's why my dad knew to take two stars Academy to Ohio because through Tyler D he was making contacts that had metal, you know? So everyone wonders, well, how did Chris Bledsoe get PTSA to metal? Cause he knows the invisible college anyway. So they're staying somewhere in a hotel, probably one of the many trips to Ohio. And dad has a dream that night. Don't be mad at me, dad. Um, Dad has a dream that night that he is on Mars and he sees Bigfoot and Bigfoot or whatever this being is uh, killed itself on accident. The, the whole species in a calamity, just like a nuclear cataclysm, something of that nature, they were wiped out. And in his dream, there are billions or whatever number of souls left the, the planet in shock and trauma through this cataclysmic event. And that the guardians who took my father, remember, this is a dream. The guardians who took my father whisked the billions of souls of these Bigfoot creatures who were once advanced, fashioned them a primitive body to be sort of like a therapy for their soul so that they could be rehabilitated, brought them to earth 
placed them here, allowed them to use their interdimensional whatever abilities. Well, why well, we can never catch them. This is all in a dream. Just that's important to know. And that they are slowly but surely being rehabilitated from the trauma of instant cataclysm. So dad wakes up. He's like, oh my God, that's a weird dream. He goes and tells Tyler D and Tyler looks at him and he said, how did, how did you know that? And dad said, I had a dream. And he said, you are the most informed person I've ever met. And that was it. Wow. I can give you a little bit of support for that. You, you mentioned the Bigfoot. We were just, before your interview, we were supposed to interview Laparitis, who claims that the, being, the, the um, Bigfoot is a spiritual being. It's not yeah. uh, a, a, something hiding in the bush. And I can support that from 1976. I live in an area with literally no trees. And there was a, a Sasquatch seen uh, near this house, looked in the window. Uh, there was a tracker tracked it into the middle of this uh, clearing. And then the footprints disappeared. And I say, if, if you think that it's hiding, it ain't hiding in Manitoba. I mean, it's a nine foot uh, Sasquatch and you got one tree per mile. It's pretty yeah. hard for it to, and that would indicate that again, like the UFO thing, the Sasquatch may not be as nuts and bolts as people think it is. I don't think it is at all. I think it's an interdimensional type phenomenon, yeah. like what my dad remote viewed in his dream. I believe that. And I know that these invisible college types were inducing these experiences in my father. Like, um, you know, you know, the one about have, how Tyler's team had a breakthrough because of my dad. You I'm mentioned sure you know. it. Yeah, mentioned that story. You mentioned one of your interviews. Yeah, I mean, basically, he induced a remote viewing session in my father through through an image. He had a dream that night, and it was these vivid descriptions of some advanced cellular interaction or whatever. And he woke up, he drew it, he sent it to Tyler, and they went and had millions of dollars worth of breakthroughs in exotic research that was able to help people be cured of cancer. So, just like uh, one of you guys said earlier, I think it was you, Grant that Tyler and all these super geniuses in the world, they're getting this information through downloads. Yeah. My father happened to help them with a download that they weren't able to get. And, you know, he's got many others. Um, yeah. Yeah, so let me, let me ask this question. The, uh, especially at times of emotional upheaval, Chris has fried all sorts of electronics around him. Oh, yeah. That answers one of those questions. But yeah. it's, but the the most the most startling uh, stories are when he's undergoing some kind of emotional turmoil. He's fried a bunch of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's flipped breakers. He's destroyed appliances. I mean, we've definitely had to replace appliances several times. And, and, and for those who can't see the chat, this is in reference to the question that says, "Does he have problems wearing watches and batteries?" Yes, he he destroys technology, and he has flipped breakers just from yeah. being upset. At one point, he made a list for me, and it was like lots of washers, dryers, uh, oh, microwaves. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, you heard the story that I said on uh, the, the Beyond Humanity interview, right, where I, I flipped a light switch and the light bulb ruptured? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I was excited. And yeah. uh, that event was synchronistic, and, and it led me the next day to um, – basically got me where I am today with my fiance. And, and um, that's a weird story. Uh, yeah. yeah, but it was the phenomenon that led me to, to make this move to um, be with my fiance. So synchronicity is a big part of the game. For yes, you as, yeah. 100%. It's a theory. So, so, so it's, it's a funny story that I can relate. Um, not, not about me, but about synchronicity. So C.C. Jung, Carl Jung, yeah. made up the term synchronicity. Yeah. And he was studying... Uh, these kind of weird, what looks like random events that have some weird correlations, which he calls synchronicities, with Linus Pauling. I mean, sorry, sorry, with, uh, with, with uh, Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics for the Pauli Exclusion Principle. And Pauli was world famous for walking into rooms and destroying electronic equipment. <laughs> he walked into a laboratory at Princeton University and he destroyed a cyclotron. Wow. Uh, it just caught it on fire. So uh, this, this, the synchronicities of all these stories are really weird. Yeah. Including sure. with the guy that made up the name. Yeah, Carl Jung, he had a dream about a, uh, an Egyptian scarab beetle and then he woke up the next morning and there was a golden beetle on his window. I had to study Carl Jung because I was a psychology major. I've taken an entire course 
courses about him and he was very much into synchronicities and archetypes and things like that. But, um, but a lot of people did not know for a long time that his number one interacting uh, person discussing weird things was Wolfgang uh, was, was, was Polly. Yeah. Wow. The bell prize well, There's another now question. Tell the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now tell the story about, about your father with the Pope in Philadelphia. Um, I have to say, I, I don't know if we should, um, continue to discuss the Vatican stuff anymore. Oh, okay. Because you I, told it in another interview. I just, I just, because you were doing the remote viewing thing. Your yeah, father well, has remote viewed it for people. I, I'll, I'll go into that. I'll go into that. Let me just say that my, my dad was, uh, we, we were contacted about some Vatican stuff. Uh, anyway, I will, I will tell that story. Um, my dad got involved with Dr. John Alexander and he, he's the guy that ran the remote viewing project. Project Stargate. I'm sure you're very well aware of that. And um, my dad had like a dream or something that the Pope was in danger of a terrorist attack when he came to Philly. This was about 2015, 2016. I mean, it, it can be easily Googled. I mean, he came. And it, dad told this to John Alexander, the Stargate guy. He said, I had a dream that the Pope was in danger. They flew him out to Philadelphia and they had him remote view the Pope in the future. And he... That's a good question. I'll get to that next. So he, he, um, in his mind, he saw the Pope, whatever he, he picked out where like a bomb was that came out of a boat, went under a bridge, all this. He saw it in his mind. He did this with John Alexander and Joe McMonagall, who was the other guy involved in project Stargate. Uh, people like Ingo Swan, Joe McMonagall, John Alexander, they were all big players. So dad's with Joe and John, he sees this stuff, they report it to the appropriate sources. And next thing you know, later on, there's an article comes out saying the FBI was um, suspicious of a terrorist attack on the Pope. Of course it didn't happen, but yes, that actually did happen. My dad was flown out there to meet some of these Project Stargate guys to, to do that for the Pope. Yeah. Um, and, then, and that's common with experiences. The girl that Tyler introduced me to was basically getting visions like that she said it was like being on the internet 24 seven. And she told the beings, I can't yeah. take it anymore. Stop it. And they stopped her for a little while. I actually went with a number of them. I, I tracked down a bunch of the things she was really accurate and she had some really, really bizarre things that she was picking up. So people have to realize this is part of the thing that people who've had experiences can suddenly sort of shift timelines and see things. It's not that uncommon. Ryan, yeah. Ryan research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have been to the Rhine Research Center. That's about an hour and a half from where my father lives um, in, in um, like the Durham, Raleigh area. We've been there as guests. We haven't been tested by them, but they're very good friends of the family. We know, I think his name is John Newth or Kruth or whatever, the director of the Rhine Center. He's a very good friend of my father. We actually recently went there with John Alexander where John Alexander gave a presentation at the Rhine Center on near-death experiences. But we, we've never been studied by them. Uh, we never thought about it, to be honest. Beautiful. Let's see, other question. What do I think the Skinwalker Ranch stuff is? Um, I think it, well, based off what I've read, I think it's um, evil spirits or some sort of black magic, demonic entity by the Ute Indians. I could be wrong. But I have known people personally who have been to Skinwalker, like the semi-vans. And I, I don't know if he went there, but John Alexander certainly did. And I guess the way you can describe the phenomenon was negative. It was, it was uh, killing animals, terrifying people, traumatizing them. I know that they did one study at Skinwalker. Um, I don't know if this is public, but I was told this by John Alexander. So they had cameras set up like in different angles. And they had a goat. That's public? Okay. Well, I was told this by John. They had a goat and it was like, next thing you know, lights are switched off, lights are on, cameras are pointing all different directions and the goat is mutilated. I mean, this phenomenon is nefarious. It followed people home. It, it tormented them. And I know somebody in private who's affiliated through this, through psychic research. I, I can't disclose who they are. Um, and they basically were like explaining to me that psychics were being used as bait to draw out this phenomenon to interact with it, but it's not a friendly phenomenon. Yeah. Makes sense to me, Native American black magic from the Ute Indians, I mean. That, that made sense to me. You brought up the thing 
about um, you were told and maybe clarify for me this, that you've got these people who are coming to you and helping you and giving you instructions, watching you. But at the same time, you're getting reports. I think it was Hal Pavmeyer who told you that you would be bugged for the rest of your life. Yeah. So is there a battle between agencies? Why would one agency try to help you and figure out what's going on and another agency seem to sort of want to terrorize you or stop you from talking? Is there two elements in the government? that are competing against each other? I, I want to put it this way where people can understand. If I say I have a friend in the CIA, that does not mean the entire CIA and United States government is represented by this individual. What that means, there are multiple factions. There are factions who love us. There are factions who threaten to kill us. There are factions who have investigated us and now they're gone. All of these individuals are affiliated with the CIA. So they all have different motives. They're all in the same agency, but they're doing different things. This is such a compartmentalized, I guess you could say structure within the CIA that you have people that don't know about these people. They have a different agenda. These people have more power here, but they have a nice agenda. It just goes on in circles and circles. It's not like I'm a Sergeant, you're a chief or whatever. Um, you do what I say. Well, this guy might have a different job with this agenda, this guy's agenda is to terrorize us. This guy's agenda, he really likes us. And this, all this stuff really happened. I just don't want to say their names. Um, there have been threats on our life. This past week, I had a run-in with um, some people that didn't like some of the things that my father put out there. And they basically were not very nice to us. They were involved in some of these organizations. And I, and I was so scared. I called Jim or I texted him and he called me. Um, they're not all nice. But just because this guy's mean and this guy's nice doesn't mean that they represent the entirety of these organizations. It is compartmentalized and factioned. There's the Invisible College. There's the Collins Elite. There's this group who is really nasty. Um, I know you know some of these people. I will not say their names. Yeah. Bob, you had said that you had backed off some people. Was that true that you were able to help Chris in some ways about surveillance and stuff like that? That was not me. No. Okay. And I do want to specify there that it's kind of hard to talk about intelligence people when you're not supposed to say their names. So I know I say this guy and this guy and this guy. Yeah, yeah. Just keep in mind, these are real people who I know um, and have met, have spoken with on the phone, have spoken with in person. It, sometimes we have to, for the sake of our comfort and safety, whatever, not say names. People yeah. think we're just holding out. There's this whole thing in ufology. Oh, they don't want to give the goods. Well, when your life has been threatened, it is a little different. Yeah. You know, you, you start to toe the line. I, and I know about the threat, so I can back you up that uh, it's not an easy position to be in where, yeah. you know, your your life could be on the line. So I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, I don't know anything about an Orion group. That was a question. I've never heard of it. Yeah, I, I've, I, I don't know um, the significance of Orion group. No idea. Okay. I think we've basically... Done it. You've done a fantastic job. Absolutely. Really good. I've seen all your interviews now and you're, you're representing the family very well. I uh, hope your father's proud of you. And uh, I hope well, the Chris book. and I've had a long conversation and I just want to say, I told Chris that Ryan's a natural. Absolutely. I agree. I'm just telling the truth guys. Yeah. I appreciate your spending time with me and I, I appreciate especially the time that you spent your whole family spent with me uh, back in um, 2013. Uh, you, you had your friends there. We had these long discussions and uh, you were very open and people have to know that, that uh, you have a wonderful family that is trying to help the world and trying to get their story out in a very difficult situation. And uh, I will back you every step of the way. Thank you. That means a lot. Beautiful. And you ever want to do it again, you know how to find me. Beautiful. Okay. We'll shut it down and um, maybe we'll do it again sometime when your book comes out. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do it again, but I appreciate your sharing with what you've got. And it's um, I say it's probably the most important story or one of the most important stories in ufology and people have to start listening to people like your father. I've said that for years and the story that he tells that it's less physical. Jacques Vallée was there 40 years ago we're moving that direction. It becomes less and less 
people in this idea that it's just aliens flying around in tin cans. Jacques Vallée said, I'd be very surprised if that turns out to be what it is. Your father's now saying that. I'm saying that. And so hopefully as the consciousness rises, we'll realize it's more, less physical, more yeah. spiritual, and about a thousand times more complex than we think it is. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, guys. And thank you, Bob, for your My wonderful pleasure. advice and, and insight. Thanks. Yep. Take care. Thank you, gentlemen.